Hi, everyone. So we've just reached the hour, so I will get started um, with the tutorial um, in a moment. Uh, first off, my name is Jane Harriman. I've been giving um, versions of this introductory tutorial for about a year, al almost a year now. I've been doing this about once a month. And the idea of this tutorial is to give you an introduction to um, the Julia programming language, or to give you a feel for you know, why you might be you know, interested in learning Julia, why the language is useful, and also to give you a feel for you know, what, it, what it's like to actually work in the language itself. Um, a little bit about my background. I actually um, am still a graduate student, and I didn't start learning to program until I was in grad school. So I've only been at it for a few years, and I started off as a Python programmer. So I, I started teaching myself to program using a couple courses on edX and, and Coursera, for example. And it was just a couple of years ago that I, I came to the Julia language and, and started sort of transitioning my workflow from Python to Julia. And I'll talk a little bit about why I did that um, in a few moments. Um, so let's get started with, with a little bit of an introduction um, to Julia first. So I want to talk to you about you know, why we want another language, why you know, the creators and contributors to the Julia language have spent so much time and energy in creating this new language. And then we'll talk a little bit about Julia in practice, and I'll go over an application of Julia to, to see what it's like out there in the wild. And, uh, and after that, we'll, we'll start the tutorial, which is on juliabox.com. And so you'll be able to, from a browser, run Julia um, in the cloud, uh, which will allow you to sort of play around in a sandbox environment on Julia Box, but you can follow everything that I'm doing with the same tutorial materials that I'll be using. So first off, this question of you know, why do we want another language? And what I'm showing on this slide is a sort of periodic table of different programming languages where those languages are color-coded by the characteristics or the features that they offer. And so the idea is with all of these existing languages out there and everything that they bring to the table, you know, why is Julia um, being created? Why do we need yet another language? And the idea is that you know, even with all of these existing programming languages out there, um, we still have a problem um, where that problem has been called the two-language problem. Um, now, if you haven't heard of you know, the two-language problem, I'll, I'll explain what that is um, now. Um, and I'm getting a message saying you can't hear me. Um, let me, I'm going to check the settings on sound first in case you can hear me at all. All right. Um, I need to turn up volume now. Okay. And it will take a minute to see if the new settings work. So I'm reporting back to our, our help on chat. Um, okay, so I'm going to proceed with talking for the moment, and hopefully this will be helpful. Um, okay, so actually I'm gonna check one other thing with my mic just to make sure that this is okay. Um, yeah, okay, everything's set up the way that I usually set it up, so hopefully this is all right. Um, so I'll, I'll dive back into the slides, and I'm sure I will get another ping if uh, the sound quality has not improved. So, okay, so, so what is the two-language problem? Um, the two-language problem comes from this traditional observation that languages tend to be either performant or productive. Um, so on the one hand of this slide, um, we're showing the idea of you know, performant or lower level languages like Fortran and C that allow you to generate really efficient machine code that you know, run really quickly. And on the other hand, we have these traditionally you know, higher level or productive languages. Productive in the sense that they allow us as the programmer to write code quickly and easily. And so traditionally we have this trade-off between languages like Fortran and C that you know, allow us to write efficient code and then these higher level languages like Python and MATLAB that allow us to write code efficiently. And the trade-off that we're faced with here isn't really truly just between performance and, and the productivity of a language. Really, we're faced with a trilemma here because the third variable or characteristic that we've been considering um, is the generality of a language. 
Um, so in comparing, you know, for example, Fortran and, and, and Python, we're talking about general purpose programming languages. But of course, there are ways to generate um, fast and efficient code efficiently for us uh, if we're working with domain specific languages or special libraries. Um, so for example, you know, you, you could generate really fast code um, in Python if you're working specifically in NumPy, but then the scope of the tools that you're able to work with will be somewhat limited relative to you know, Python, the general purpose language. And so facing this, this trilemma or this trade-off between performance, productivity, and the generality of the pro programming language you might choose as a tool, the traditional workaround is to work with two different languages. Um, so this is where the idea of the two language problem comes from, the idea that we start by prototyping in a higher level language that allows us to you know, get proof of concept out quickly. And then once we really need something that can hit scale, we'll switch to a different language um, so that you know, maybe we'll translate our Python or our MATLAB code into C or C++ um, to allow us to, to do those calculations more efficiently. So this two language problem is the reason that the Julia language has been developed. And the tagline of Julia is it looks like Python, feels like Lisp, and runs like C or Fortran. And so I'll talk you through what I mean when I, when I read off this tagline. Um, really what this tagline is saying is that you know, Julia offers productivity, generality, and performance. And uh, let's start by talking a little bit about you know, Julia's performance to get a feel for that. So as part of the tutorial that we'll do today, we're going to do some benchmarking exercises in Julia. In particular, we're going to benchmark different implementations of the sum function, where the sum function is going to take some vector and it's going to add together all of the elements of that vector. Now, for the purposes of benchmarking, uh, we are going to be uh, passing to our different implementations of sum a 10 million element vector. And we're going to look at different implementations in, in C, in Python, and in Julia, both some you know, prepackaged, pre-written ones like the sum that comes with Python and the sum that comes with Julia, the sum that comes with NumPy. Uh, but we're also going to look at handwritten implementations in each of those languages to give us a feel of you know, what sort of performance we're getting out of the box when we you know, maybe implement something custom ourselves. And so when we look at handwritten implementations of the sum function in C, um, it's going to take order of 10 milliseconds uh, to add up all the, the elements of this 10 million element vector. When we do the same operation with a handwritten implementation of sum in Python, it's going to take you know, order of 500 milliseconds. And when we go to Julia from Python, we're going to be back down to order of 10 milliseconds. So this gives us a sense of you know, Julia's performance um, you know, converging on, on C speeds. And you know, after talking about the performance of Julia, we can, we can discuss you know, the productivity of the language and you know, maybe the ease of use that Julia has to offer. One way that we can talk about the productivity of the language is by comparing what Julia code looks like to code in you know, other high-level languages. And so if we actually look at our implementations of the sum function in Python and in Julia side by side, what we'll see is that they're really not that different. So, um, in, in Python, on the left here, um, we have a couple uh, differences in required uh, keywords and, and colons, for example. So we have the def keyword, um, we, have, we have required colons, required indentations. In Julia, we have the option to use indentations. We instead have the required function and end keywords and, and no colons. Um, but other than these minor syntactic differences, you know, we can express ourselves pretty much the same way in these two languages where, you know, with the code on the right, in, in Julia, we're getting more than an order of magnitude performance improvement. And it was really, you know, this sort of minor syntactic difference in, in the languages that got me excited about moving from Python to Julia. Um, so I had a friend who had been sort of facing his own version of the two language problem where he was trading off between, you know, MATLAB and C, depending on what he was writing and at what scale he needed his computations to run. And then he found Julia as a graduate student and would often say that uh, you know, the two language problem was, was keeping him from graduating. And if you have a, a finite horizon to, to actually get out of graduate school, you want to be using a tool like Julia. And he was, he was very enthusiastic about this new programming language. And what really convinced me to try it out was that at some point he took a piece of code that I had written in Python, translated it to Julia, and then we benchmarked those two different implementations 
And I saw that you know, the code that he had translated to Julia really didn't look that different from the code that I had originally written, but you know, I think it ran something like 12 times as fast. And seeing that I could you know, get such performance bo boosts when I was you know, starting to hit bottlenecks in my own work without actually you know, going through a ton of labor to learn a new language was what got me really excited about, about starting to be a Julia user. Okay, so this third thing that I said that Julia offers is generality. Um, so, and this is what we mean when we say that working in Julia feels like working in a Lisp, um, where Julia offers, you know, metaprogramming facilities. Uh, you can program in, in macros. Uh, the design paradigm of, of Julia is multiple dispatch. The language is, is dynamic, it's parametric, it's, it's homo-iconic. And, uh, and the fact that Julia is such a, a powerful and a general and expressive language is what allows Julia to be mostly written in Julia itself. Um, now one of the things that's really cool about the fact that Julia is mostly Julia under the hood is that this starts to blur the line between users and developers of the language for us. Um, so that means that you know, a lot of our most important contributors to the language and to the broader ecosystem are people who came to the language as users you know, without you know, formal training in CS necessarily or you know, a lot of experience with other programming languages. And those individuals found that once they were able to use the language for their own purposes, they were able to start looking under the hood and seeing you know, how they could actually make changes to the base language um, to sort of better suit their needs or, or their curiosity. And so with that, um, I'll talk about a, a quick application of Julia. Um, the application or the, the use case of Julia in practice that I always like to talk about is the Celeste project. Um, so the Celeste project took data from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. Now this was an effort to collect data on about 35% of the vi visible sky. And in the process of the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, they collected something like 178 terabytes of data, which you know, I'm always forgetting you know, what tera and these different prefixes mean. So that's you know, 1.78 times 10 to the 14 bytes. Now to give you a sense of scale for how big that data set is, it would take over 25,000 DVDs to store that amount of data. And as a sort of fun and silly statistic, if you wanted to print all of that data on paper, it would take you more than 150,000 pickup trucks uh, to, to carry around that much paper carrying, carrying this data set. So, uh, so it was a huge data set. And the first more than a decade that the data set was around, there wasn't a whole lot done with it. But then this research team came together, uh, the Celeste research team, and what they decided to do was to take you know, this huge data set and to process it um, to, to analyze it using Julia exclusively as their software, or rather to, you know, to build their software, and, uh, and then NERSC supercomputers from, uh, NERSC is the supercomputing facility associated with uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab in the Bay Area um, as their hardware. And so you know, using Julia and, and these supercomputing machines um, together, what they were able to do was that they were able to take this data set and catalog you know, 188 million stars and galaxies. So this meant identifying the colors and the morphologies and the brightnesses, um, the locations of all of these different astronomical objects. And they were able to do this entire calculation in under 15 minutes. And now, you know, doing such a huge calculation in such a short period of time um, made Julia uh, actually the, the third language to join the petaflop club, hitting over 1.54 petaflops um, per second. Um, so it was the third language after I think Fortran and C were formerly the, the only two languages to have crossed the pet petaflop barrier. And in doing this calculation, Julia uh, made use, or rather the calculation made use of over a million threads and 9,000 nodes uh, on NERSC machines. Uh, so this gives us a sense of you know, Julia's ability to, to distribute uh, calculations on, on next generation machines. And so, you know, the natural question is like, why was Julia the language used in the Celeste project? And, and what did Julia actually bring to the table as the language used? And, you know, maybe the first you know, natural response based on some of the things I've said is that, well, you know, Julia addresses the two language problem. And so absent using Julia on this project, perhaps, you know, two different languages would have needed to be used. Maybe, you know, there would have needed to be some prototyping in Python, some translation to C, and then that would have introduced, you know, a redundancy to the workflow of the research team. And, you know, so maybe using Julia was better because that redundancy was removed. Um, and that's true. Uh, but really, the impact of using Julia on this project was much more profound than that. 
because you know the fact that that everybody on the team was working in the same language from the beginning really changed the dynamics of the team and the way that the two language problem often plays out in larger teams where people have very different backgrounds um, is that you know, often the team will sort of split between you know, the domain scientists or the people with you know, higher level knowledge of the project, um, or rather you know, higher level, level knowledge of, of programming maybe, and, and deeper knowledge of the, of the subject matter, the subject matter experts, um, and the computer scientists or the HPC experts who will um, you know, take care of getting performance out of the project. Um, so typically what might happen is that prototyping in a high level language would happen by our domain experts or you know our physical scientists in this case um, whereas you know when they were done they would probably pass the baton off to the computer scientists or the hpc experts who would have done that translation to a lower level language but instead having you know the entire team work in one code base from the beginning I mean that they could iterate much more rapidly and you know really allow both the, the science and um, you know, the expression of the science and their code base to evolve together. Now, outside of this LESS project, we're seeing uptake of, of Julia in various places across industry. Um, on this slide, I'm showing a few uh, companies that have you know, either Julia users or um, employers who are hiring Julia. And, uh, and these statistics are a little bit outdated at this point, but um, we have some numbers here on you know, our, our growing package ecosystem, um, the downloads that we've seen for um, you know, Julia, um, which is all you know, available and, and free um, on, on GitHub and on Julia Lang at julialang.org. Um, and let's see, beyond that, um, after this tutorial, I have a few links here for you to connect with the broader Julia community. And so please you know, feel free to, to join our communities on Slack and Discourse and GitHub. GitHub is where all active development of the languages is occurring. Um, and then we have really friendly people on, on Slack and Discourse who are happy to answer questions as you're starting to get up and running with using the language. Um, I did realize I forgot to show um, this Julia Lang dot learning page. So if you go to julialang.org slash learning, um, this is where you can find some other resources for learning the language. So we have um, you know, some tutorials that have already occurred on different parts of you know, the Julia ecosystem, um, upcoming tutorials, though there's really only one scheduled now after this one, and um, other tutorials on the language as well as you know, textbooks that you could look into if you're interested in finding additional resources. So with that, if you're ready to log in, um, or if you ha haven't yet, um, you can log in at juliabox.com. Uh, once you go to juliabox.com, you'll see that you'll have the options to log in with email, um, GitHub, Google, LinkedIn. Um, so for example, if I were to log in with GitHub, um, normally as, as many people are logging on at once, it can take a little bit to spin up additional nodes. Uh, once you've done, once you've clicked login, uh, you'll be prompted to hit launch. And once this is set up, we'll have access to Jupyter notebooks that we can run in the cloud. Um, so you'll be able to run you know, the same notebooks that, that I'll be going through as I talk us through this tutorial. Um, in particular, what we're going to see after this is loaded is that um, there will be a tutorials directory. And there that is, tutorials. Uh, inside the tutorials directory, you'll want to go to introductory tutorials. And inside introductory tutorials, we can go to this intro to Julia tutorial. Um, so it's inside this directory that we see a bunch of numbered notebooks. And it's the notebooks uh, between 0 and 12 that we'll be using today. Um, now I'm going to run on a local copy. So let me flip over to that. All right, here we go. All right, so we're going to start with uh, this notebook 00, which will show you what working in a Jupyter notebook is, is like, in case you haven't worked in this environment before. And then notebooks 1 to 6 are really meant to be a whirlwind tour of Julia syntax, um, to give you a, a sense of what it's like to work in the Julia language, what it looks like. And at the end of, of most of these notebooks, there will be exercises um, to allow you to start playing around with code um, 
and, and make sure that you know, you're able to follow what I'm covering. And if you have any questions at any point, um, please feel free to ask in the live chat. I know Chris Rakakis is helping out there, and often we have other people popping up to answer questions as well. Uh, after Notebook 6, uh, that's when we'll talk a little bit about the package ecosystem, so how to bring in packages from the broader Julia ecosystem. Um, and then we will talk about plotting in Julia. Uh, notebook 9 is our benchmarking notebook where we'll look at those different implementations of the sum function, as I mentioned in the introduction. And then Notebook 10, we'll talk about multiple dispatch, so the design paradigm of the language. And we'll start to get a feel for why Julia is fast. And then in Notebooks 11 and 12, we'll look at some linear algebra functionality within the language. So with that, I will flip over to this Notebook 00 on Jupyter Notebooks. Um, so first off, in a Jupyter Notebook like this, uh, we have you know, both a menu bar and then a series of buttons up here. Um, and so if you want to add additional cells uh, like these, we can add this plus sign. And now you see that I have this new cell where I could add code. Um, there is a difference between cells that have markdown, um, like this one here where we have some text formatting, and cells that allow you to actually you know, enter and run code. Um, the cells that allow you to run code are denoted by these inputs or in statements to the left of them. And if you want to run an individual cell, you can simply select that cell, and then you can hit shift and enter, for example, or, uh, or you could hit this run button up here um, below the menu bar. Alternatively, if you wanted to run an entire notebook, for example, you could go to cell and then hit run all or you know, run all above or all below, depending on what you want to do. Uh, now, one of the things we're seeing here is that in this uh, cell, where I have two different lines of code, one where I add one and one together, one where I add two and two, the output of only the last line of the cell is actually being printed to standard out by default. And if I want to suppress output for that last line in the cell, I can just add a semicolon after that last line. And then it looks like nothing happened, but those computations were still performed. Uh, also, I should say, in a Jupyter Notebook, the order in which you run the cells does matter. Um, and so the state is changing. And if you, you know, overwrite, um, it, that would just mean that you would want to be careful about you know, overwriting or, or updating or you know, changing any of the variables or data structures that you've created over the course of, um, of running a notebook. Um, now, two other things I'll say about this environment um, extend to the, the Julia REPL as well. Um, so both if you're in a Jupyter Notebook like this or if you are at um, a REPL that you, you know, pulled up in a, in a terminal, for example, you can access help mode within Julia by entering in a question mark. So here, if I, for example, enter a question mark before the name of a function, I'm asking for help. Um, for, for working with this function, and I'll get whatever documentation is bound to that function. Uh, so here we see the documentation and a few examples for this println function, which is the most common way to print in Julia. Uh, similarly, if I were to, at the REPL or in a Jupyter Notebook, type in a semicolon, I'm going to enter shell mode. And so that means that I'll be able to use commands like ls and uh, pwd to see, for example, you know what files I have in my current working directory and what the name of my current working directory is. So that's it for our first notebook or our zeroth notebook uh, on, on Jupyter Notebooks. And the next notebook then is called uh, Getting Started in Julia. So in this Getting Started notebook, we're going to talk about how to print in Julia, how to assign variables, uh, how to comment, and then we'll look at the syntax for basic math. So first off, we typically print in Julia with this println or you know, print line function. And here, what I'm doing to print is just um, calling that function and putting a string that I want to print a standard out inside of it. Um, though I could, for example, add like a number to the end if I wanted to. So we can see that println takes you know, not only strings, but, but other input types. Now, if I want to assign a variable in Julia, I can simply write the name of the variable that I want to create, um, put an equal sign to the right of that, and then the value that I want that variable to take on to the right of the equal sign. I don't need to explicitly tell Julia what the type of that um, variable needs to be. So here I'm creating a variable called my answer, and by using this type of function on my answer, I can see that Julia can tell that this is an int64. Similarly, when I create my pi, uh, Julia can tell it's a float64, and when I create this smiley cat emoji variable, 
uh, smiley cat emoji is a string. So, um, <laughs> so after assigning a, a value to a variable, um, there's no issue with reassigning that variable to you know, a value of a different type. So for example, we just made smiley cat emoji a string. Um, if we wanted to reassign it to one and then ask you know, what the type of that is, we can see that we had no issue changing it from a string to an N64. And you know, as a, a side note here, uh, coding with emojis is a really great example of a way in which Julia allows us to write very generic code. Um, so for example, you know, in Julia I could assign a zero to a happy face and a negative one to a frown face. And now I can actually evaluate Boolean statements like this one, which says that you know, now it's, it's true um, that if we have a frown face and add a smiley cat, we end up with a happy face. So commenting in Julia, uh, we can create single line comments or you know, blocks that do not get executed as code within, you know, within a code cell um, by preceding that single line comment with a hashtag or a pound sign. Um, if we want a multi-line comment, we can sandwich that multi-line comment between lines that have pound signs and equal signs, as I've done here. So that creates a multi-line comment. And then for basic math, the syntax will look pretty familiar to most people with the caveat that um, you know, if we are exponentiating in Julia and you're coming from a Python background, it might be a little weird at first that we're using a caret sign to uh, exponentiate rather than using the double star operator. Um, that's the one that always gets me when I'm flipping back and forth between the two different languages. I, I always trip and fall on my face when I'm trying to exponentiate things. And, and then, as I said, there are exercises at the end of uh, most of these notebooks that allow you to start playing around with some of the things I've shown in the preceding notebook. And if you need help with any of those or if they don't make sense, uh, please ask in live chat. So that's notebook one. And notebook two is on creating and working with strings in Julia. So in this notebook, we're going to talk about how to create a string, how to interpolate strings, and how to concatenate them. And so first off, there are two different ways that we can create a string in Julia. We can enclose text uh, inside a single set of double quotation marks, as I've done here to create the string S1. Or we can enclose text inside three sets of double quotation marks, as I've done here to create the string S2. Um, there are a couple differences between these types of strings. For one thing, we can actually use double quotation marks now um, inside the second type of string, but not the first. So if I try to quote, as I'm doing here, by putting this, this word error inside quotation marks, inside the first type of string, uh, we get an error because it's ambiguous where the string actually ends. On the other hand, it's unambiguous here um, that when I say errors inside double quotation marks, um, that that's you know, not saying anything about where the string stops or, or, or begins. Another difference between these two types of strings is that we can add some formatting into the second type of string. So here I've added a few new line characters by just hitting return inside um, the sets of quotation marks. And we can see here that Julia was able to tell that I added those new line characters. Another thing to say about creating strings is how not to create a string. So unlike in Python, for example, um, and also MATLAB, I believe, uh, you cannot create a string by using single quotation marks. And when we enclose the letter A here inside single quotation marks, we're actually getting a, a char um, or a character in Julia. And if we try to enclose many such characters inside single quotation marks, we get an error. So string interpolation. Uh, string interpolation, for those of you that aren't familiar, is when you want to literally evaluate you know, the value of a variable, for example, um, inside a string rather than having um, rather than having the language interpret or you know, understand um, that, uh, that variable as just the name or like the text name um, of the variable. And so I'll show you what I mean by that in case that's not clear. Um, first, I'm creating a few variables here. There's this one called name, one called num fingers, one called num toes. And here I am interpolating um, this variable name uh, by throwing a dollar sign in front of the variable name. Um, and here, I'm throwing dollar signs in front of the variables num toes and num fingers. So now when we run this, the printout that we get inserts the value of the variable name and the value of the variable num fingers and num toes, which are um, the, the variables that I've created right here. We can also interpolate expressions. Um, so we can, for example, add together 
the numbers, numb fingers, and numb toes before adding that result inside the string. And we can do that by putting a dollar sign now um, to the left of parentheses that enclose the expression that we want to evaluate. And so when we do this, we interpolate the number 20 into the string. Okay, so the last section in this notebook is on string concatenation, uh, which is you know, when we join different strings together to create longer strings. And to do that, we're creating a few new variables here, S3 and S4, which are two short strings. And then we brought back, back a smiley cat emoji as the number 10. So the first way that we might concatenate strings in Julia is to use this string function. Um, and so we can pass string arbitrary numbers of arguments. So here I'm passing string the strings S3 and S4, and then we're getting this single output string, how many cats is too many cats. Um, but if we wanted to, we could pass it you know, three or four or five, however many, um, input arguments. And those input arguments don't have to be other substrings. So here we're passing the substrings I don't know but, um, smiley cat emoji, which is an integer from up here. And then uh, the string is too few to get this single output. Um, I don't know, but 10 is too few. Now, um, another way that we could concatenate strings together is by using this star, or what is typically the multiplication operator. So it looks here like I'm multiplying together the strings S3 and S4, and I'm really getting this single output string. Uh, this first exercise, I think, is, is a useful one. Um, I mean, hopefully they're all useful, but uh, this is a, a fun one to point out, I think. Um, the idea behind this exercise is that when you exponentiate anything in Julia, um, you are really calling the star operator under the hood. So here I'm, you know, I'm calling the star operator to multiply two by itself multiple times. Um, so given that the star operator is defined as a way to concatenate strings in Julia, if I were to say hi to the thousandth power I've really concatenated high with itself many times. And, uh, and so that gives you a, a, an easy way to be extremely friendly. OK, so notebook three, then, um, is a notebook on data structures. So we're going to talk about uh, how to create and, and work with tuples, dictionaries, and arrays in Julia. Um, now, for those of you that might not be familiar with the distinctions between these data structures, the sort of high level understanding that I think is important for, um, for differences between these data structures are you know, functionally, how are they different um, for the user? And, and the important things to keep in mind there are that tuples are immutable. So once you've created a tuple, you cannot update it. You can't change any of the, the elements or its contents. Um, tuples are ordered collections of elements. Uh, arrays are similarly ordered collections of elements but you are able to update them, unlike tuples. And then dictionaries are mutable, so we can update them the same way that we can update arrays, but unlike tuples and arrays, dictionaries are unordered. Um, so they are a form of, of hash table, if that's a familiar term. Um, and I'll, I'll walk you through now, and we'll, we'll go over that in a second in case that was too much too fast. Um, so tuples in Julia. We can create tuples in Julia by enclosing ordered collections of elements inside parentheses. And so here I'm creating this tuple called My Favorite Animals, uh, which includes penguins, cats, and sugar gliders as strings. And because this is an ordered collection of elements, we can index into the tuple, or we can you know, reach inside and say, I want the first element or the second element. And we can do that by throwing square brackets after the name of the tuple, and then inside those square brackets, putting the number of the element that we want to grab. Um, now, one of the things you might notice now if you're coming from another language is that uh, Julia is one indexed. So that means we start counting from one, which is probably intuitive if you know, you're coming from MATLAB or if you're um, uh, relatively new to programming. Uh, but, you know, or, or I'm sure there, there are many other reasons that could, that could be intuitive. If you're coming from Python or C, um, you know, those languages will start counting from zero. And so then this can uh, take you a little bit to, to remember and start feeling comfortable with. And, uh, and finally, because tuples are immutable, and as I said, we can't update them, um, the first element of my favorite animals is always going to be penguins. We can't change it to otters after the fact. Now, as of Julia 1.0, which we're working on now, uh, we have named tuples in the uh, base Julia language. 
And so what that means is that we have the option to create tuples where we've sort of assigned variables to the elements of those tuples such that we can access the elements of the tuples, not only by saying I want the first element or I want you know, the last element, um, but also by saying I want the element tied to this particular variable. So here I'm creating a different version of my favorite animals where I've bound these variables um, bird, mammal, and marsupial to the contents. And so now I can still reach into my favorite animals and grab the first element, which is still penguins. Or I could say, you know, my favorite animals dot bird, for example, and that will allow me to access penguins or my favorite animals um, dot marsupial is going to give me the sugar gliders entry. Okay, so next up we have dictionaries in Julia. Um, now dictionaries we can create by using uh, this dict function, capital D-I-C-T. And we can always initialize an empty dictionary. So I could just say, you know, my dict, my dictionary is called, um, or it is an empty dictionary here. Um, or I can initialize a dictionary to have key value pairs. Um, which will be where those, the values uh, will be associated with the keys um, that we've uh, sort of bound them to. Um, we can do that. We can create an, a dictionary that begins with key value pairs um, by putting our keys to the left of right pointing arrows that we create with an equal sign and a right pointing arrow head and then values to the right of that. So in this example of a dictionary, my phone book, we're creating a dictionary that has entries for uh, the key Jenny, the key Ghostbusters, and then we have strings that enclose uh, the phone numbers of each of those um, to the right of the arrows. Now once we've created this dictionary, we can perform a lookup or grab one of the values associated with a given key by putting our key of interest inside square brackets after the name of um, a dictionary. So this looks very similar to you know, indexing into a tuple, for example, um, or you know, reaching inside a tuple to grab an element. Um, so when we put Jenny inside square brackets after my phone book, we get Jenny's number. Now if we want to add um, additional entries to an existing dictionary, we can do that by using the same sort of lookup syntax where we're putting now our new key we want to add to the dictionary inside square brackets after the name of the dictionary. And then we put the new value that we want to associate with that key to the right of an equal sign. So here we're adding Kramer to the phone book. And we can check to see that that worked by looking inside my phone book and seeing that we've successfully updated to three entries now. If we want to remove Kramer or, or any other entry from a dictionary, we can use this pop bang function in Julia. And I'm calling it pop bang because notice that it's, it's the word pop followed by an exclamation point or a bang. Um, I'll talk in a later notebook about why some functions in Julia are terminated with exclamation points and why others are not. Uh, but for now, we'll just use this function, popbang. And we do that by passing to popbang uh, the dictionary that we want to update as the first input argument, and then the key from the key value pair that we want to remove as the second input argument. When we run that, it returns the value to us from the key value pair we've just removed. And if we look at my phone book, we see now that, uh, that Kramer has been removed successfully. And again, because dictionaries are not ordered, we can't ask for, for example, the first element of a dictionary because there is no such thing. And so if I look inside my phone book and I say I want something associated with the number one, Julia thinks that I'm asking for a key called one, which doesn't exist in this particular phone book. And so we're getting a key error. Okay, so finally we'll talk about arrays in this notebook. Now, arrays we can create by enclosing ordered collections of elements inside square brackets. And my first example of creating an array here is this one called My Friends. Um, one of the things that we see when we create an array, we get this sort of output signature here that's telling us that the array that we've created has five elements. And it's also giving us some information about the type of the array that we've created. So what we're seeing here, this one is indicating the dimensionality of the array. So it's saying that we have here a 1D array. And then this is telling us that this 1D array that we've created includes elements that are of type string. So similarly, if we were to create, for example, this array called Fibonacci, we would see that Fibonacci is a 1D array, um, or we could refer to it in Julia uh, as a vector. 
um, which is a 1D array or a vector of N64s. Now there's no issue with creating an array that has you know, various different types inside of it. So for example, when I create this array called mixture, we have included both strings and numbers inside, um, inside mixture, and we can see that this is now a 1D array that takes any um, as its input type. All right, so if we want to, to look up the value of an element inside of an array, we can do that by throwing square brackets and the index of that element we're interested in um, after the name of the array, just as we did in the case of tuple. So in this case, we can see that the array my friends has as the third element, Barney. If we want to update an existing element of our array, we can use this same indexing syntax. And now to the right of, um, of you know, this part where we're grabbing the third element, we would put an equal sign and then what we want the new value of the element to be. So now we're going to change Barney to Baby Bop. And I can add a cell here and prove to you that that worked by running my friends. So there we see that Baby Bop successfully replaced Barney. All right, so if we want to add additional elements to the end of an array, we can do that by using this push bang function. Now push bang is taking the name of the array we want to update as the first input argument, and whatever we want to add to the array as the second input argument. So when I run push bang on Fibonacci, we're adding the number 21 to the end, and we can remove whatever is on the end of that array by simply specifying to the first input of pop bang the name of the array that we want to update. So if I say pop bang on Fibonacci, we're going to return the number 21. And if we look at Fibonacci, we see that we're down to 13 as the, the end number on the array. And if we were to keep running this, we would you know, keep removing whatever's on the end of the array. So there's not a way to pop bang off um, a particular element um, that's not at the end. So the above examples of arrays were all for you know, 1D arrays that contain scalars as their elements. But we also can create arrays of you know, other arrays. Um, generally, we can create data structures of other data structures. And we can furthermore create multidimensional arrays. Uh, so let's start by talking about um, data structures of other data structures or arrays of arrays. So here I'm creating this array called favorites. And now one of the things that we see here when we look at this signature, first off, maybe I want to point out, this array only has two input elements. So that might be counterintuitive at first, but then we look at the type of the array that's actually been created. And what we see is that this is really still a 1D array. So this is the dimensionality of our array, 1D array. And then on the inside, we have the type of the elements. And we see that this 1D array contains other 1D arrays, um, where the 1D arrays that it contains are strings. So we could also refer to this as a two element vector of vector of strings. Similarly, if we look at this array called numbers, uh, we can see that this has three elements, um, an element for each of these subarrays, And we can see here that we've created a 1D array that contains vectors of integers. Now one function that allows us to create multidimensional arrays, which are distinct from these arrays of other arrays, um, is the function rand. So if I say rand on four and three, I'm going to get a 2D array denoted by the two here, um, or a matrix of floating point numbers. So what the rand function does is that it takes arbitrary input arguments that specify the dimensions of the array that it's going to create. And, uh, and then it creates an array by default that has random values as its elements between zero and one. Um, we can specify, I'll, I guess I could show this now. We can always um, specify a, a collection of things that we want to populate this randomly generated array with. Um, so for example, the way that I would create a range in Julia, so the range one to 10, for example, is by putting the beginning of the range, a colon, and then the end of a range. And so here I'm saying I want to create this four by three matrix or this four by three 2D array uh, that has integer values between one and 10. So when I run this, now I'm getting a random matrix um, that has integer values. If I wanted to create a higher dimensional matrix, I can just pass more input arguments to rand. And so here I'm creating a 3D array denoted by the three here that is four by three by two. 
And the very last thing that we will say about arrays before um, moving on to the next notebook is that you want to be careful when you copy arrays. Um, and I'll show you an example of what I mean when I say that. So I've, we've already created this array here called Fibonacci. Uh, if we wanted to copy Fibonacci, perhaps the first way that we might do that is by assigning some numbers to uh, Fibonacci. Now, when we do that, we now we have an array called some numbers, but if we update that array called some numbers by, for example, indexing into it, grabbing the first element and then updating that first element to be the number 404, and I'll show you that worked. Okay, so now some numbers uh, looks like Fibonacci did before, except it starts with 404. Uh, what we see is that if we look inside Fibonacci, Fibonacci also has been updated. So Fibonacci also starts with 404, even though we didn't explicitly update Fibonacci. And the reason is that when we created some numbers in this way, we didn't actually copy Fibonacci. We didn't create a new array. All we did was that we gave a second name to an existing array, such that now you know, we can enter that same array using either some numbers as the name or Fibonacci as the name, and we see the same update. Um, independent of what we're calling the array. So if we want to copy an array, if we want to create a distinct version of that array, then what we would want to do is use this copy function. Um, here I'm just restoring Fibonacci to its original state, so we're getting rid of that 404. And then I'm creating a new array here called some more numbers by copying Fibonacci with the copy function. Now this means that we can update some more numbers, um, changing again that first element to 404. And if we look at Fibonacci now, Fibonacci won't be changed. And for those of you that are interested, there's also a function called deep copy, which would allow you to recursively copy all the elements um, of an array, uh, which is relevant if, for example, you have other arrays as input arguments um, to a, or not input arguments, but as elements of an array. Okay, and so that's it for notebook three. So we're halfway done with our, our whirlwind syntax tour of Julia. And we'll now go to notebook four on loops. So in this notebook, I'm going to show the syntax for while and for loops in Julia. We'll start with a while loop. Um, so while loops in Julia use the while and the end keywords. Um, and then we have on the same line as the while condition or as the while keyword, um, typically the condition that we're evaluating to see you know, if we should enter the loop body. So my first example of a while loop is here where we're counting from one to 10. And let's see, if we run that, we should get the integers between one and 10. Um, a couple things to say here, I guess we're, we're bringing in that println function that we saw earlier. Um, we are able to update numbers in Julia um, by saying, or to, to increment numbers, for example, by saying plus equals. So alternatively, we could have written this as n equals n plus one, um, and I'll comment that out so you can see the difference, n plus equals one, those say the same thing, this and that. Um, also, another thing to point out here is that uh, we don't need to worry about particular spacing in Julia. So for example, if I added arbitrary indentations, my code is now less readable, but still executable in the same fashion with the same output. Uh, so Julia, for the most part, is white space insensitive. Um, when I say for the most part, what I mean is that Julia does detect new line characters, for example, between you know, this line and that line. Um, we could even, if we, if we don't want to explicitly use new line characters like this, we could replace new line characters with a semicolon. Um, so for example, I could also add a semicolon there, and the loop still works the same way. A uh, second example of a loop here is uh, this one where I'm greeting all the elements of this my friends array and let's see here we're using string interpolation we're indexing into an array um, a new thing that we're seeing here is this length function which gives us the number of elements in an array okay so for loops are next to write a for loop in julia we need our for keyword our end keyword and then we'll typically use this in keyword to um, sort of distinguish between or as a separator between our, our local variable for the for loop um, and the values that it will take on from whatever our loop iterable is. Um, so this loop iterable could be a collection or it could be a range. Um, and I first demo counting from one to 10 with a for loop using a range here as we saw in the last notebook. 
where um, yeah, where we're calling the print ln function inside the body. And I think the, the one other thing I wanted to say here, which I didn't show when I talked about ranges in the last notebook, is that we can add steps to ranges. So for example, I could say one colon two colon 10, and now I'm saying that I want to take steps of size two as I go between the numbers one and 10. So when we run this, now we're only going to be printing odd numbers, and we could do this for you know, whatever integer we might like there. Um, and then finally, we have another example of a for loop here where we're iterating over all the entries of, um, of this array, my friends. And so now we're using our array as our loop iterable instead of the range that we used up here. And with that, we're going to do a couple more examples of, um, of creating for loops, particularly um, in the context of creating some addition tables. Um, so the idea is to show you some different ways of, um, of writing nested for loops um, in Julia. Uh, so when I say that we're going to be creating some addition tables, what I mean is that we're going to be creating matrices where every element of the matrix that we create will be equal to the sum of the row and the column indices of that matrix. Um, and so we can start by doing that by creating a matrix of zeros. And here I'm creating a matrix of zeros called A by using this fill command. So the first input to fill is whatever I want to populate the array that I'm creating with. So here I'm creating an array of zeros. My first input argument is zero. And then the second input argument to fill can be a tuple that specifies the dimensions of the arrays you want to create. So here I'm saying I want a five by five array. I could also create higher dimensional arrays in the same way, um, but that is not useful for creating an addition table. So we'll go back to this five by five array um, or this five by five matrix. And then we can populate all the elements of this matrix A now by, created an, by creating a nested for loop. And so here we have one for loop that's taking our, our variable I from one to M and another for loop inside um, which is taking the variable j from 1 to n. And then you know, we're updating each of the elements of the matrix accordingly. We could have done this exact same thing will, while using uh, some syntactic sugar to create our nested for loop. Uh, so here we're creating again a matrix of zeros. And now we have that same nested for loop, but with some Julia syntactic sugar. And you see right away that we have now only one for keyword, one n keyword, rather than having you know, this explicitly sort of embedded for loop here. And what we've done is that we've brought this, um, this line where we're iterating over j from one to n onto the same line as where we're taking i from one to m. And we've separated those two statements by a comma here with the same result when we when we run this cell. So uh, this is very nice when you have you know, many levels of indented loops. It can, it can sort of maybe make your code look cleaner and perhaps more readable. Um, the third way that we're going to create an addition table is with an array comprehension. Now we haven't talked about array comprehensions yet. So I'm going to show a somewhat more simple example first. Um, the idea of an array comprehension is that we cre can create an array with code um, sort of self-generates an array rather than you know, explicitly populating an array with the elements that we wanted to have. So for example, we've seen that we can create an array by creating some, some square brackets and then you know, typing out, I want this array to contain the numbers one, two, and three, for example. But instead what we could do if we wanted to create an array is create some square brackets and then we could write, for example, um, four X in the range, you know, one, two, 100. Um, I want to populate this array with the variable x. Um, so I'm putting now what is typically thought of as like my loop body to the left of this for statement. And when I do that, I'm creating this array that has the numbers 1 to 100. This loop body can, of course, become more um, complex. So for example, I could say, you know, x to the third power is what I want to populate um, the array with for every entry in the range 1 to 100. Um, and now I'm getting that output. So this is a 1D array comprehension. And if we want to use uh, an array comprehension to create an addition table, which would be two dimensions, we basically are just taking this for statement here that came from this condensed sort of syntactic sugarified um, for statement up here. And we are copying that. Uh, we're putting it inside of our square brackets. And then to the left of the for keyword is where we put what is effectively our loop body. 
we're saying i plus j is what I want to be the element of the array um, in this position. And so when we do this, we're creating a new addition table called C with an array comprehension, um, where this is the first time that we've created an addition table without needing to sort of pre-allocate or pre-create an array uh, using that fill command, because we just generated this addition table now on the fly. So that's it for loops. And our next notebook, notebook five, is on conditional statements. So in our, our notebook on conditional statements, we'll start by talking about the you know, traditional way to write conditional statements in Julia using these if, else if, else, and end keywords. Uh, where typically you know, we have a condition on the line of the same line as our if statement. Um, and if we have additional conditions to evaluate secondarily, uh, we would put them on the same lines as these else if statements. Now my first implementation or example of using these conditional statements is um, an implementation of the FizzBuzz test. So for those of you that haven't heard of it, um, the FizzBuzz test is this uh, oft-discussed online um, programming interview question where the idea is that you, know, you might in an interview be given uh, the challenge of determining whether a number is uh, divisible by three or five or both three and five. And if the number is divisible by only three, you want your program to print fizz. If it's divisible by only uh, five, you want it to print buzz. And if it's divisible by both three and five, then you want it to print fizz buzz. So to test our implementation, we can pick a number and I'm going to pick the number 83. Um, and so here what we have in this conditional statement uh, first, we're checking for divis divisibility by 3 and 5, and we're doing that with this AND um, statement. So we can say AND in Julia with either a single um, or a double ampersand. Um, and I'll talk about the difference below in this notebook. Um, and then we're also checking for equality here. That's a new thing that we're seeing with a double equal sign in Julia. And here we're using the modulo operator to see what the uh, remainder is when we divide the number n by 3, for example, and checking that against um, the number 0. We also could have done this using the is equal function in Julia. So I could have said, for example, um, is equal, and then I could say uh, n modulo 5 and then 0. And so if we run this, um, we see that we're printing the number 83 because 83 is neither divisible by um, 3 nor 5. Um, but if I gave the number 150, for example, and reran this, then I would get fizzbuzz. So that's our first example of sort of a, a regular conditional statement in Julia. Um, I really like showing ternary operators in Julia because I hadn't seen them before um, when I was uh, working in Python. And a ternary operator in Julia looks like this. Um, so this is an alternative way of writing an if, else, end statement. Um, what we are doing here is that we've taken an if else end statement where A is the condition that we're evaluating for true or false, um, B is what we do when A is true, C is what we do when A is not true, and we've just rewritten it using now a question mark and a colon instead of using the if else and end keywords. And so as an example of this, let's say we have two numbers, 3 and 400, and um, we're going to compare the value of the numbers or the values of the numbers x and y. And we're going to return whichever of those two um, variables is, is bound to the larger number. And so if we run this, we see that we're returning um, the number y, um, the number 400 bound to the variable y. Um, but we could rewrite this same if else end statement using a ternary operator like so. So we've taken the condition that we have here, um, basically pasted it there, and then we've put a, because we don't actually need, just to make sure this isn't confusing, we don't actually need these parentheses here. Uh, we put a question mark after this condition. We put x there, colon, and then y. And again, we're going to return 400. Um, so these two things are doing exactly the same thing. The final thing to discuss in this notebook uh, when we're talking about conditionally evaluating expressions uh, is the concept of short circuit evaluation. And so the idea is that in Julia, by default, if we were to say um, 
and by using an ampersand. So for example, true and true. Um, you know, this is evaluating to a true expression because both true and true are true. Uh, but the idea is that when we use a single ampersand like this, we end up um, evaluating the second expression. We end up checking to see whether the second expression, um, oh, well, of course we are. That's a very terrible example. What am I trying to say? Um, what I want to say is, okay, let's evaluate this expression. This makes more sense. Uh, yeah, if you know where I'm going, you'll understand why this is a better expression. Otherwise, I'll, I'll get there in a second. Um, okay, so now we're getting false when we say false and true because both of false and true are not true. Okay, uh, so the idea of, uh, of this, this default behind using a single ampersand is that we're going to eagerly evaluate this expression. And so that means that even once Julia has already seen that this first input um, to and is false, Julia is going to continue and evaluate the second expression to see whether it's true or false. And that can be computationally inefficient and a waste of time, and so therefore we might want to short circuit this evaluation. I can add a second ampersand here, and what that means is that um, as soon as I know the answer to my Boolean statement, I'm going to stop looking for more information. So as soon as I see false in this case, I am going to not evaluate this true statement. Now the output looks, looks the same here, um, both with and you know without the ampersand, so it's hard to see what's actually going on there, which is why we've added some print statements to the examples here. Um, so the idea is that now, we can see that we never actually evaluated this expression when we use a double ampersand here um, because we never print this high. Um, however, you know, we're printing high here um, when we started with true. And similarly, if we took this down to a single ampersand here, we would print high um, and do that eager evaluation. So the idea here is that when we use a double ampersand to say and, we are conditionally evaluating this second uh, input um, on the basis of the veracity of this first input. Okay, and so as an example, I think this is going to be unhappy. Yeah. Uh, well, there are a couple things going on here. First, we need a Boolean statement on in the second uh, part of this, in the second input argument. So here if I put true, um, for example, I won't get this stack trace, um, or I do. Okay, I'm doing something wrong there. I'm not sure what the stack trace is for immediately. Um, oh, or is it just, it's just because I gave the error here. Okay, I'm sorry about that. Um, but yeah, the idea is that here we get to um, produce this error because x is greater than zero. Um, and let's see. And if we make it such that this first condition is false, then we never actually error out here because we never evaluate that expression. Um, let's see. Okay, and we haven't talked about the OR operator yet in Julia. Um, so we can say OR in Julia with either a single vertical line or a double vertical line, um, where as in the case of short-circuiting AND, short-circuiting OR uh, happens we have a double line and the eager evaluation OR happens with just a single line like so. And so when we short circuit our OR here, um, we just evaluate and uh, print a standard out true as soon as we see our first true. We never get to the point where we say hi. And in the second case, we keep looking and we get to the part where we say hi. So that is it for notebook five on conditionals. And our last notebook in sort of the whirlwind tour of Julia syntax is this notebook six on functions. And so in this notebook, we are going to talk about how to declare a function. Uh, then we're going to talk about duct typing in Julia. Uh, we'll discuss mutating versus non-mutating functions then, which is going to take us back to this idea of some functions having a bang at the end, like pop bang and push bang, as you saw earlier. And at the very end, we will talk about some higher order functions, um, specifically map and broadcast in Julia. So starting with how to declare a function in Julia, I'll show you three different ways to do that. The first is to use this function keyword and the end keyword, where we'll put our function name and any input parameters to that function um, inside parentheses after the name of the function. So here we have a function named say hi with the input name. 
And the loop body, or not the loop body, the function body in this case, uh, is this statement that we're going to print uh, a string greeting the input name. So we can run the cell to declare our function say hi. And we are similarly declaring this function here called f, uh, which squares x. And one of the things that you might notice is that there's no return statement here. Um, by default, Julia is going to return whatever is on the last line of a function body. However, if you like the return statement and you want to be explicit about it, you can say return. That option is always available to you. If you want to call either of these functions, you can simply pass input arguments inside the parentheses after the name of each function. So I can say say hi, um, call it on C3PO, and then we get this greeting to C3PO. And I could pass 42 to the function f, and then we get the square of 42. Now, alternatively, we could have declared either of these functions um, without the function or the end keywords. And we could have done that by simply writing out the function name um, and the function input arguments inside parentheses, uh, putting an equal sign to the right of that, and then a function body to the right of that. So now we have this function called say hi to, and this function called f2, which squares. And we can call either of these two functions the same way that we declared, or rather that we called say hi and f. And so the way that we declare the function does not impact uh, how the function operates when we call it. Now the final way that we might uh, declare a function is as an anonymous function, or um, a lambda function is another name for this. So if you haven't seen um, anonymous or lambda functions before, the reason that they're called anonymous functions is that you can actually declare a function like this that has no name and therefore no way to access it after it has been declared. And so what's going on here is that I have an input argument, here name, um, and then I separate my input argument from my function body using this arrow that I've created with a dash and a right pointing arrow head. Um, another thing to note is that if, if you wanted to create, um, for example, a function that had multiple input arguments, you can do that by enclosing those multiple input arguments inside a tuple, for example. So I can say first name and then last name inside parentheses there. Um, and now I could say first name, last name. For example, so that's a way of declaring a function um, anonymously uh, that has multiple input arguments. Um, so when you first see this way of declaring a function, it can be a little confusing. Like, why would you ever want a function that you can't actually access after you've declared it? Why would you want an anonymous function? Um, there are uses for functions that don't have names, um, and we'll see that at the end of this notebook. But for now, if you do like declaring a function in this way, but you want to be able to access it afterwards, you can kind of cheat by binding a variable to the function. So I could say, say hi3 equals, and now say hi3 is a variable um, when I run this cell. And that means that I'll be able to now access this function after I've created it. Similarly, I'm binding the variable f3 to this function, x to x squared. And now that I've changed the way that say hi3 works, um, because it takes two input arguments, um, I can run say hi3 this way. Um, so we have the syntactic sugar for calling functions, uh, anonymous functions that have been bound to variables the same way that we would call a function that was declared by either of the two mean, other two means, um, with a function in end statements or the equal sign. Okay, so our next section in this notebook is on duct typing in Julia. The point of this section is that Julia functions tend to work on whatever inputs make sense, and I'll show you what I mean when I say that. Um, so the, the idea is that you know, we've declared this function, we've used this function called say hi, and so far we've used it on strings. But under the hood, when you run say hi on any input argument, what's happening is that it, that input argument is getting interpolated into some string. So that means that say hi is going to function on any input for which string interpolation is well defined. So if I call say hi on a number, I'm getting the same string interpolation, and here we're uh, greeting a, a minor uh, peanuts character. Uh, similarly, the function f, we've seen it work on numbers so far, but if we had a matrix A, for example, and if I call this function f on A, I'm going to be able to just square that matrix because uh, the square of a matrix in, in, in Julia is well defined as you know, the matrix times itself. Uh, similarly, the star operator, um, 
you know, is defined as a way to do string concatenation. So if I try to square this string high, um, it's going to work. Now, on the other hand, I don't have a way under the hood to multiply a vector by another vector. So if I create this vector called v, and then I call f on v, um, I'm going to get an error because there's no method. Um, there's no method for exponentiation of a vector in Julia. And Julia is not going to take a guess at whether we're basically trying to you know, do element-wise exponentiation of an array. If we're trying to you know, get an inner product or an outer product, um, Julia doesn't know, so Julia just gives us a method error. Okay, mutating versus non-mutating functions. Um, this is what brings us back to some functions ending with a bang and others not ending with a bang. And so a mutating function uh, in Julia by convention will be terminated with a bang or an exclamation point. Uh, what is a mutating function? A mutating function is a function that will alter the state of some of its input arguments when you run that function. Um, a non-mutating function, on the other hand, is going to take an input, it's going to perform some action or some, uh, yeah, some action probably using that input, um, and then it's going to create a distinct output that it's going to give to you at the end. Um, so let's look at the difference um, between a mutating and a non-mutating function in Julia to give us a sense of, of what this difference really means. Um, and again, I should say, it's, it's only by convention that functions in Julia are terminated with an exclamation point. If you write your own functions, they can be mutating or non-mutating with or without exclamation points. Um, but for clarity, for helping you know, users of your code, remember, for example, whether the function is mutating or non-mutating, following this convention is very helpful. So, okay, an example of mutation versus non-mutation. Uh, here we're creating a vector called v, and we are calling now sort on v. Um, so when we call sort on v, we get this sorted version of the output vector. But after calling sort on v, when we look at v itself, v is still that unsorted vector that starts with the number three rather than the number two. On the other hand, if we call sort bang on v, we are still getting this sorted output vector that starts with the number two, but when we look at v itself, v is now also that sorted vector. Okay, so the final section in this notebook is on higher order functions. Um, if you're not familiar with the term higher order function, uh, a higher order function is just a type of function that happens to take other functions as its input arguments. Um, a classic example of a higher order function is the function map. So map is going to take as its first input argument a function, and as later input arguments, collections that the first input argument will be applied to element-wise. And so for example, if I call the function map on the function f, and then the collection um, or the vector that has the numbers one, two, and three as elements, what happens is it's like we've applied the function f to each of these elements, and we've got an element-wise squaring of the vector that contains one, two, and three. Um, higher order functions now are a place where we can actually make use of anonymous functions that have no variables bound to them. Because if we have an anonymous function like this one, um, we can just throw this as an input argument now to the function map, for example, um, without this function having a name to be useful to us and actually cube all the elements of uh, the collection that we're passing to map. So when we run this, uh, we're getting element-wise cubing. Now broadcast is a generalization of map. So it's another higher order function in Julia um, that in all the ways that map works, works exactly the same way. Um, so if we were to pass f and this vector one, two, three to broadcast, um, we get that same element y squaring. The, the difference um, between broadcast and, and map um, is a little bit beyond the scope of this tutorial, but the idea is that um, with broadcast, unlike with map, or maybe, maybe I should start with map. Map, um, when you broadcast over two um, collections, for example, you would need those collections to be of the same size. So if I want to broadcast an operation where I'm, you know, I'm doing something by lining up you know, the inputs of two different vectors, um, I would need the vectors to be, um, you know, to both have n elements, whatever n is, so that there's a match you know, between the first element of the first vector and the first element of the second vector. Um, with broadcast, that condition is not necessary. You could, for example, have a vector that you add to a matrix for broadcast. And what broadcast will do is it's, it's kind of smart and it'll figure out that, you know, maybe you want to add that vector to, you know, each of the, 
columns, for example, of, of the matrix that you are um, trying to, to broadcast over. Um, and so it does, um, I think the, the technical way to say this is that it expands the unary dimension of um, the objects that you're passing it um, so that you can get commonly sized uh, input arguments to broadcast effectively. Um, if that, yeah, again, and that's beyond the scope of this tutorial, so don't worry about it if, if that functionality doesn't sound like something that would be useful to you. Um, so, so really, uh, the reason that we're bringing up broadcast here um, is that even if we're just treating it as a clone of map, uh, it comes with the additional benefit of having some syntactic sugar for getting called under the hood. And we can call broadcast uh, with some syntactic sugar by instead of saying broadcast explicitly, just adding a dot after the name of whatever function it is that we would have passed to broadcast. So broadcast f on this vector one, two, three is the same as saying f dot. Um, so here we're getting that element wise squaring. And to sort of drill in that point, um, here I'm creating this vector or this array, this matrix A, um, that has the numbers one to nine from the top left to the lower right hand corner. Now if I call f on A, I'm getting matrix matrix multiplication of A times A. On the other hand, if I call f dot A, then I'm getting element wise squaring of all the entries of this matrix. So one of the things that's kind of cool about this dot syntax is that it gives us a way to maybe more naturally um, express more complicated mathematical expressions. Um, so I, I think that it's a little bit easier when you look at this expression to have a sense of what's going on, like what operations are being performed, um, than it is here, which is, you know, this code will do exactly the same thing, but in this latter case, we're making this explicit call to broadcast, we're passing in a lambda function um, that's going to act on our input matrix A. Um, so, you know, this is a bit closer perhaps to the math that we might write down on paper. So that is part of the idea behind this, um, this dot syntax for broadcast. Um, so that is it for notebook six, um, which ends our sort of whirlwind tour on Julia's syntax. And I definitely need a quick sip of water, but then we will get started on this notebook seven. Okay. All right, so notebook seven is on packages. Uh, Julia has, I don't know the exact number, but over 2,000 registered packages at this point. Um, if you're interested in the exact number, you can go to either pkg.julialang.org uh, or juliaobserver.com, which will show you not only the number of all the packages out there, but also what all the different packages are and start to get a sense of what functionality they might provide. Um, the ecosystem has been you know, continuously growing, um, but one of the design um, preferences or yeah, one of the design objectives of the language from the beginning was to make sure that it provided excellent foreign function interfaces. So the idea is that we have packages like you know, PyCall and RCall, for example, that allow you to call Python built-in functions and R built-in functions. Um, there are also lots of packages out there that have wrapped um, packages from other languages. So the idea is that it should be easy for you to get you know, functionality from other languages that you might you know, be relying on, such that if you wanted to start switching over to Julia or playing around with Julia, uh, you shouldn't have to you know, like rewrite everything that you're working in um, all at once. And furthermore, you know, if there's some piece of the Python or the R uh, ecosystem that you quite like, um, and if that functionality doesn't happen to exist yet in Julia, then you could continue using that functionality or that, you know, that library, that module, whatever it is, um, insofar as that works for you. Um, and so um, if you want to check out the ways to do that, again, you could go to either of these, um, these addresses to see what sort of functionality, what sort of libraries are out there. Um, and the purpose of this uh, notebook is really just to give you a sense of how to you know, install and, and import um, packages from the broader ecosystem, how to actually start using them. And so the first thing you would want to do with a new package manager on Julia 1.0 is to say using PKG, where PKG is the package manager. Um, and, and then once you're using PKG, and, and sorry, explicitly, or to make this more explicit, um, this is if you wanted to install a new package um, that you've never used before. So let's say that I want to install the example package. I would have to say using PKG, 
and then I can call PKG by saying pkg.add, um, and then I would put the name of the package that I want to install inside quotation marks, um, inside the parentheses after the call to pkg.add. Now, we don't actually have to run this cell today because I've already installed um, locally, and then also on JulieBox, you have installed all the packages that we're going to use. Um, and you only have to install a package the first time you use it on a given Julia binary. However, every time you use a package, you every time you use a package, for example, in a new Julia environment, like maybe you've opened up a new notebook or you've just written a script um, or you've just opened up a new REPL session, you are going to want to um, import or, or load the functionality from that package. And you would do that by using this using keyword. So say that we've already we've already installed example. We can now say using example, and that's going to bring you know, all of the functionality of the example package into my, my current working environment. And so that means that if I were to go to the source code of this example package um, and see, for example, this hello function that is included inside the example package, um, I will now have access to the hello function. Um, having access to that means I can call hello on the string that I've passed to it here to print off some Adele lyrics, for example. Similarly, uh, if we wanted to demo the colors package, you know, we could install the colors package by saying pkg.add um, colors, but we don't need to do that today because colors is installed for us. So all we have to do is say using colors to bring colors functionality into our current environment. And having done that, we now have access to this function called distinguishable colors, which is going to create a color palette for us based on the number of colors that we pass as an input argument to distinguishable colors. So here we have this palette of 100 different colors. And one of the things we saw earlier was that you know, we could, let me add a cell here, that we could create, you know, random matrices by passing integers, um, specify the dimensions of matrices we want to create. We also saw that we could pass, you know, ranges, for example, the range 1, 2, 10, to get, um, for example, an integer um, random matrix. Um, but we can pass other collections, like this palette, uh, to the rand function. So this is sort of a fun example of um, not only using package functionality, but also of ways in which Julia can produce very generic code. Um, so now, you know, every time we run this, we're going to get a different randomly colored uh, matrix. Okay, so that's how we use packages in Julia, and this becomes relevant in our next notebook, which is notebook eight on plotting in Julia. Okay, so there are a bunch of different ways to plot in Julia. Um, I think I already, I'm just gonna run this notebook. Um, yeah, there are a bunch of different ways to plot in Julia, um, which mostly rely, a, a lot of the ways to plot in Julia rely on calling you know, backends or, or plotting infrastructure from other languages and libraries. Um, for example, you can plot with PyPlot in Julia. Now today what I'm going to be showing you uh, to use for plotting is this plots package or plots.jl. And what's cool about the plots package is that it gives us a way to plot in Julia um, where we can have a common set of syntax for multiple different backends or multiple different you know, plotting tools so that we can write some code to generate a plot and then if we want to change the tool that we're actually using to create that plot um, after we've written our code we don't have to update the code much to um, to create an, a plot with a different backend or with a different plotting tool um, all we have to do is just change the line of code where we're specifying which backend we want to use and I'll show you what I mean by that here um, but the idea of this notebook, first we, we start by saying using plots, so using the plots package to load it. And then here we're creating some data that we are going to um, be plotting to demo our, our plotting capa capacity. Um, the data here I took from the internet. It is uh, for a few years between 1860 and 2000, um, the global temperatures in degrees Celsius. And from left to right, I've typed in uh, the values in, in Celsius um, from the, the earlier years on the left to the later years between 1860 and 2000 on the right. And then uh, this, this array num pirates contains approximations for the numbers of pirates uh, in the world at the corresponding years. Um, again, going from left to right uh, with increasing years or moving forward in time from left to right as we read each of these arrays. Okay, so we want to plot this data now. So the first thing that we would do is we would tell plots what backend we want to use. And the backend that I'm starting with here is this GR backend. And you would want to just look at the plots documentation if you wanted to like see which backends are available, for example. So 
we're calling gr, we're going to be plotting with gr, and we can do that now by using this plot command and this scatter bane command. So to plot, we're passing our independent and our dependent variables, and we're specifying here that the label we want to give to this first um, plot, thing that we're plotting is line. Um, so we can see here that we created this line plot, this blue line there, when we ran this plot command. And then here, the scatter bang command is creating these orange dots. So the reason that this is scatter bang rather than just scatter is that if it had been just scatter, we would have created a separate scatter plot, and then we would have had one line plot, one scatter plot. The fact that this is scatter bang is telling Julia, telling plots, that, uh, that we want to actually mutate whatever the last plot we created was, such that uh, we get an overlay of our points and our lines. Okay, and then once we've created this plot, we can update it further by using you know, more of these mutating functions like x label bang, y label bang, title bang to annotate our plot. And here we're putting, uh, you know, we have global temperatures on the vertical axis, we have uh, numbers of pirates on the horizontal axis, and then uh, we can see that what we're overall plotting is um, some data about the influence of pirate populations on global warming. Um, this data looks a little weird at first. Uh, it looks weird because it looks like pirate populations uh, or rather, it looks like global temperatures are going down as we go from left to right. And the reason is that by default, Julia took whatever is on our horizontal axis um, and plotted uh, our, our numbers going from low to high, from left to right. And if we were to look at this original data, I told you that I had sort of typed in from left to right um, the values from the earlier years to the later years. Um, and we see that pirate populations are actually going down. Um, whereas they're displayed as going up here. And so what we really want to do if we want to be looking forward in time from left to right is we just need to flip our data or flip that x-axis. And we can do that with, where am I? The xflip bang command. Right, and that's what I do here, xflip bang. Um, so now this version of the plot is showing uh, temperatures going up as power populations are dropping as time marches forward. Um, and so the idea here is that we clearly need more pirates if we want to reverse climate change. Um, so there's that. Uh, helpful recommendations that you're getting alongside the, the main content of this tutorial. Um, all right, so if we wanted to use a totally different backend, now we could do that. And we could do that by simply copying whatever code we needed to generate a given plot. And here I'm gonna rerun this part. So here we're loading the pyplot backend here. And then, oh no, xflip bang. There we go. Okay, so this is the exact same code that we used to generate the first plot above. Um, but now we're using pyplot as our backend uh, to generate our plot. Um, similarly, there's this um, backend called Unicode plots, which will give you a Unicode style plot. It doesn't have the xflip bang command to my knowledge, so I need to take that out and we end up having our data sort of reversed to demo it. Um, there. So this is what our plot would look like in, in Unicode. All right. And then the last important thing about this notebook is this bit on creating subplots. So the idea here is that we created this range from negative 10 to 10 for x. And then here, we're creating a bunch of subplots. Now, the way that we do this, the way that we create subplots is that we have these distinct calls to plot for each of the subplots that we want to add to a larger plot. Um, so here we have P1, P2, P3, and P4 as the variables bound to each of those plots. And then we have this fifth call to plot here where we're passing each of those variables as inputs um, to plot. And then we're specifying how we want to you know, create a layout of these plots with the layout keyword here. So we're getting a two by two grid. We could have equivalently created like, you know, a four. I'll rerun this. Um, oh, it's Unicode plots now. And then the layout is different. Okay, I'm gonna go back to PyPlot because I haven't played too much with Unicode plots. So if we go back to PyPlot, we rerun this. Great, okay, so that's our two by two layout. If we were to change the numbers that we have here, we could change the, the way that our grid is structured. So that is it for plotting, and we are now on to notebook nine.
Uh, notebook nine is our benchmarking notebook. And this is another notebook that I'm going to run up front um, just so that we don't have to wait at all for benchmarking to happen. Okay, so what's happening in this notebook? Um, the first thing, uh, the idea of the notebook is that we're implementing and benchmarking different implementations of this sum function. This sum function is taking a vector and it's adding together all the elements of the vector. Um, as for the different implementations that we'll be considering, this is a list of all the different implementations we'll be considering. We'll be looking at a handwritten implementation of sum in C without any optimization. We'll be looking at a handwritten version in C where we've added the fast math flag to give us some, some kick. Uh, then in Python, we're going to look at the built-in version of sum in Python, the NumPy built-in version, um, and also a handwritten version in Python. And then in Julia, we'll look at a built-in version of sum, a handwritten version of sum, and then a handwritten version of sum where we've added some simd um, with a, a small modification to our handwritten code. Okay, so for getting started, we start by creating a vector a that has 10 million elements, and we're going to be passing that to all these different implementations of sum to see how those implementations do. So we've got this 10 million element vector of A. Uh, we use the ran command to create it, so we've randomly populated this array with numbers between 0 and 1. So as a quick sanity check, if we use the built-in version of sum in Julia, and we call that on our vector A, we should be getting about 10 million, the number of elements, times about 0.5, the average um, value of any given element. So we should be getting about 5 million as our output, which we do. So this sum seems to be working. That's great. OK. Uh, now, how do we actually benchmark any given implementation? Um, you could benchmark in Julia using this at time macro. Um, if you're not familiar with a macro or like what a macro is, don't worry about it. Just think of it as a funny command that starts with um, an at. Um, but so this is a macro. It's called the at time macro. I could use the at time macro to benchmark if I wanted to. Um, because when I call this at time macro on this bit of code called sum or sum on a, um, I'm going to get this output time and also a statement about how much memory it took to run that piece of code. Um, but what we're seeing here is that when we call at time on sum of a three different times, we get three very different answers. And the differences in those answers could just be like, you know, the direction the wind was blowing or, you know, whatever I have running uh, in the background on my machine. So if we want something a little bit more reliable than the at time macro, we might want to use the benchmark tools package, um, which we could install with the commands that are uh, commented out here. But yeah, we would say using benchmark tools to use the benchmark tools package. What's cool about the benchmark tools package is that it will run any snippet of code that we want to time many times and then it'll present some statistics for us, or uh, depending on what function we're using, it can pre present a bunch of statistics to us, um, giving us information about, for example, like what the, the fastest runtime was, what the slowest runtime was, so that we can get like a more reliable sense of how long a given operation is going to take in this environment. So we're using benchmark tools today, and then we can get started by looking at our implementation um, of sum in C, which is handwritten. And I didn't create this original notebook, so um, I did not write out this bit in C for us. Um, but what we can see that's cool here, uh, even if I'm basically just treating this as black magic, is they were able to write code in C within a Jupyter notebook, you know, within Julia environment generally. Uh, we were saving that C code here to a string called C code. Um, and then our black magic includes uh, actually compiling this uh, bit of code um, included, included in this uh, C code string. And then once we've done that, we're taking, we're using the C call function, which allows us to call functions from within C, including the function that we just created here. Um, we're using C call to rename that function from C as C sum in our current environment, such that we can use it within our Julia environment. Um, and then we do, uh, every time we do an implementation like this, we're gonna have some sanity checks and then also our benchmarking. And so the sanity checks in this case include seeing like, okay, yeah, when we call CSUM on A, we're getting about 5 million. That's what we would expect. That's great. Um, more precisely, if we were to compare the outputs of that built-in function um, sum in Julia and the CSUM function that we've created, we get about the same result. Um, we're checking that we got about the same result with these curly brackets. Um, the curly bracket, as shown here, 
um, is a way of calling the isAprox function under the hood. And the documentation for isAprox is shown here. It's basically a way to compare two different numbers that are really the same, but maybe not exactly the same uh, because of like floating point differences, for example. Um, but you can specify whatever tolerance you deem acceptable when you're comparing two different numbers with the isAprox is function. So uh, we do some benchmarking of this handwritten CSUM here using this at benchmark macro that we got from the benchmark tools package. And when we benchmark CSUM on our vector A, what we see is that the best it ever does is about 11.6 milliseconds. And then the worst is, you know, more than twice as bad. Um, that's pretty normal. Um, we can see the number of samples that were run, for example. We can see median and mean times. What we're going to take as our, our result for comparison against other implementations is whatever the minimum runtime is. So we're taking the best case scenario for every implementation that we're looking at. And we do that um, by reaching inside um, this cbench variable that we created, um, grabbing all of the different times with cbench.times. We're doing that here too. Um, and then we're taking whatever the minimum of all those different timings were um, and getting rid of our, our milliseconds reporting there. And we're adding that to this output dictionary D that we're creating here so that we can keep track of all the different timings as we go through our different benchmarks. So here we have now our output dictionary D. It has one entry now for the language C, which is in milliseconds the best case scenario for our, our runtime, adding up the 10 different 10 million elements of the vector A. Okay. Uh, one last thing we have in this section is just this uh, histogram here to give you a sense of how how the different run times looked, um, like how many how many in each bin for you know different run times um, might exist, and so we can see that we have this distribution um, of run times uh, when we look at all the different uh, samples in our last benchmark, and uh, and yeah, it's this best case scenario from down here that we're actually going to be using for comparison. So. Now that we've looked at our best case scenario for a handwritten implementation of sum in C, we can now add the fast path flag by just changing the way that we compile um, our C code, but using the same string um, containing our C code from the last cell above. Um, so we're adding this flag here when we compile. We are again using this C call function to rename um, what is now our C sum uh, as C sum fast math in our current scope. And then we do some benchmarking of CSUM fast math to see that we can get to under five milliseconds when we use some, some optimization in C. So we add that to our output dictionary D. And I'm going to talk about, yeah, as we go on, and especially at the end, we'll talk about the actual comparison um, for all of these different um, values. But yeah, we're adding, we're adding to our di dictionary D the fast math version of C here. And then we move on to Python. So we can start by looking at Python's built-in sum function, and we can do that by using the pycall package. The pycall package, which we're using here, gives us access to this pybuilt-in function. We call the pybuilt-in function on sum, which is the name of the function that we're grabbing from the Python uh, namespace, and then we're calling it pysum in our current namespace. And so I can call pysum now on the vector a as a sanity check, see that we get about 5 million, more precisely it's very close to the same output that we get when we use the built-in sum. So that function is working the way we think it should. And then when we benchmark, uh, we see that it's taking over a second, actually, when we use that function um, in our current scope. So we're adding that output now to our dictionary D. And then we can look at our built-in version of sum from NumPy. So to grab functions from NumPy, we're now going to be using the conda package. The conda package, um, from there we are using the, uh, the pi import uh, function to say, okay, it's specifically from numpy that I want to grab sum. And then when we benchmark this numpy sum function, we're seeing we're at about five milliseconds. Um, and so we add that to our output dictionary here after doing some sanity checks. And lastly, for Python, we can look at our Python handwritten, which looks, again, very similar to the code that we might write in Julia to implement sum in a hand, handwritten way. Um, also note that we can declare our own code in Python within a Julia environment by just adding this little pi uh, keyword here outside of a triple quoted string. So we're benchmarking our sum pi here um, to get our handwritten Python function. And again, it's taking over a second now. 
So we're adding that output now to our output dictionary D. And finally, we get to move to Julia. And so in Julia, we'll again start by looking at a built-in version of sum. Um, the built-in version of sum, you could look at the source code for that if you were to just go to the file here. So here's another macro, the at which macro. Uh, when we call at which um, on a piece of code, and we'll, we'll look at this, at this again in a later notebook, but when we call at which on a piece of code, um, at which tells us where the code that's being run came from originally. So here it's telling us like which version of sum is getting used and where was sum originally written. And so we end up seeing when we call at which on sum of A that the version of sum being used as the default in Julia here is the version that's declared inside this file called reduceim.jl and it's at line 645 that we can find the source code. Now if you go there, what you'll see is that sum itself in, in Julia is, is written in Julia and so it's not you know, implemented in some lower level language under the hood. When we benchmark this, we see that we're under 5 milliseconds um, for that, that um, yeah, built-in version of sum. Uh, we add that to our output dictionary and then we look at our handwritten version of uh, sum in Julia, um, similar to our Python handwritten code. We benchmark that and we're taking under 12 milliseconds now to, to execute that handwritten code. So we add that to our output dictionary and finally we're going to just tweak our handwritten code a little bit. So it's basically like we copied and pasted the code from above, but then we added this at simd macro. So that macro is saying that we want to use single instruction, multiple data on this for loop so that we can do multiple things at once. And using now this just tweaked version of, of our handwritten implementation of sum, when we benchmark it, we're now down to under five milliseconds. Um, okay, so we're gonna add that to our output dictionary and I went over the results really quickly because I wanted to sort of talk about everything at the end. So this is an ordered version of our output dictionary now where we can see how all the different implementations did against one another. Um, okay, so what are we seeing here? Um, one of the first things I'm gonna say is that uh, even with benchmark tools, there's some noise um, from one run to another. And so I wouldn't say that, you know, Python's NumPy is actually meaningfully slower than, um, than Julia's built in on the basis of this benchmarking. I would say that these top four are really competing neck and neck. Um, yeah, in terms of speed. And so, okay, so, so what are we seeing here? We're seeing, first off, that, you know, Julia's built in is working, you know, a, about as fast as some, you know, somewhat optimized C code, um, C with fast math. Um, it's also working as well um, as Python's NumPy, which is you know, going to be very optimized C code under the hood. So Julia's built-in is, is just as good as, as, as C code in this case. Um, another thing we're seeing, Julia's handwritten is doing about the same as C's handwritten. Um, and so again, Julia and C are neck and neck. Um, we're also seeing that you know, by doing a minor modification or adding a minor modification to our Julia handwritten code, just adding that, that one macro for, for SIMD, we were able to get basically all of the way um, in terms of, of optimizing our code or you know, getting performance comparable to this more optimized um, built-in version of SUM in Julia. Uh, other things, let's see other things. Other things include the fact that you know, even if we didn't want to worry about adding the SIMD flag, even if we you know, were just going to work with you know, our own custom Julia you know, handwritten code for whatever the thing is that we're building, um, the performance that we get relative to the more optimized built-in code is, is really great. Um, so you know, there's, there's a little bit more, sometimes it's like a factor of two here, we're approaching a factor of three difference between the Julia built-in and our Julia handwritten, but that difference is amounting to, in this case, like a handful of milliseconds. Whereas you can see that if you were thinking about you know, writing something custom in Python and moving from like NumPy to, to handwritten Python, um, the difference or you know, the divide between what you're going to write um, in general purpose Python versus you know, what functionality you might get out of optimized C running under the hood in NumPy um, is, is much more vast. Um, and so that's it for our benchmarking notebook. So that is the end of notebook nine.
Uh, we have just a few notebooks left before the end of our tutorial. Notebook 10 um, is going to be our notebook on multiple dispatch, where we will talk about our, our design paradigm in Julia, what makes the language fast. And the notebooks 11 and 12 are on uh, linear algebra. And today I'm planning to end around uh, 1230, uh, maybe a little earlier, depending on, on how we go with timing. Uh, but yeah, three notebooks left, so here we go to multiple dispatch. Okay. Um, and actually, before we start the main notebook on multiple dispatch, one um, description of multiple dispatch that really helped me to, to understand it um, and to start to put it in context um, was the following. Okay, so um, most of you probably uh, haven't heard of, um, of multiple dispatch. I, I certainly hadn't before I started you know, coming to Julia. Um, so yeah, most of you probably haven't heard of multiple dispatch. Uh, most of you probably also haven't heard of single dispatch. Um, so I'm going to explain single dispatch um, because that's a little simpler to understand. And then multiple dispatch is a generalization of single dispatch. Um, now to put single dispatch in context and to understand it a little bit better, um, we can start by thinking about object-oriented programming, which you may not have heard of, but um, is at least more common than, uh, than, than the term single dispatch and multiple dispatch. So, um, so let's start by thinking about object-oriented programming in case that might be a little bit more familiar. Um, in object-oriented programming, we create different classes of objects. So for example, I might create a class um, called cat, and I might create another class called dog. And now I have these classes of, of cats and dogs, and I can create you know, distinct um, distinct objects or you know, I can instantiate objects from either of these classes. I can create um, a cat called Winifred and I can create a dog called Fido. Um, okay, and so with each class is associated methods um, particular to that class. And so for example, I might have a method called uh, say hi that works on the cat class and I might similarly have a method called say hi that works on objects of the dog class. And so when I call say hi on Winifred the cat, uh, Winifred the cat will meow. That is how she says hello. Uh, when I call, say hi on Fido the dog, I'm going to get a bark because that is how Fido says hello. Um, and so what's happening there is that we're calling say hi in both of these cases, in the case of Winifred and the case of Fido, um, but whether we get a meow or a bark depends on like the status of the object that's, that the method is being called on. So um, it depends on whether or not uh, you know, Winifred is a cat or a dog, and if she's a cat, she meows. Um, and so what's going on here is that, you know, often the syntax in, in object-oriented programming languages um, maybe confuses a little bit what's going on um, in that you'll often, the way that you would often write this is that you would say something like Winifred dot say hello or say hi. Um, and and the fact that you're saying Winifred dot say hi maybe distracts you from the fact that Winifred, the cat, is actually an input argument to the method say hi. Um, but you know, even though you're not calling say hi explicitly on like you know, the on, on Winifred is the first input argument after after the call to say hi. Um, Winifred is still an input to say hi, um, but Winifred does have sort of a, a privileged status. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yes, Winifred the cat is is privileged. Um, she is privileged in the sense that uh, she is the input argument that is solely determining whether you're getting a meow or a bark at the end of the day. Um, and so, in object-oriented programming, we're using we're using single dispatch. We are determining which method gets called. In this case, whether we're getting the version of say hi that creates a meow or the version of say hi that creates a bark. Um, we're determining which one gets called based on the status of a single input argument, the status of that object, which is either a cat or a dog. Now, in contrast to this use of single dispatch, in multiple dispatch, we would look at every single input argument and the types of every single input argument that get passed to a function, and we would use all of those different input arguments and their types to determine which method ultimately gets called at the end of the day. And this is extremely useful to us um, as users because it means that we don't have to think so much about you know, which method we need um, in a particular case or how to create an optimal method for a particular set of input arguments. 
um, we can just you know sort of use a general term like say hi um, we can make a general function call and then we get the benefits of, of using a method that's you know tailored or very specific to the, the exact set of input arguments um, that we've passed um, that was a lot of information and it was a lot of me just like talking um, and so now we'll go through the notebook and I'll start to give you some examples of using multiple dispatch and like what I was just saying okay great so multiple dispatch so okay so in this notebook let's start by talking about some things that we've already seen we have already seen that the function f uh, can be written as such, and we don't have to specify what x is. We don't have to say, like, this thing, this function f that squares things, it takes integers, or it takes floats, or it takes matrices. We don't have to say any of that. All we say is it just takes stuff and it squares it, insofar as the stuff can be squared. And then Julia is able to figure out on its own what to do with the number 10, because it knows how to square numbers. Um, Julia, on the other hand, does not know what to do with a vector when we try to square it so it gives um, an error message. Um, on the other hand, if we wanted to specify what input arguments are, are valid or, or what input arguments should be used for a given function, we can annotate our input arguments when we create a function. So we could say, for example, the function foo uh, takes these two input arguments, x and y, and we can annotate x as a string by saying colon colon string. Um, and we can annotate y as a string by saying colon colon string. So now x and y both have to be strings when we declare this function foo. And when we call this function foo, we're going to get this printout to standard out saying inputs x and y are both strings. So that is great. Now when we call foo on the strings hello and hi, we get that expected output that says inputs x and y are both strings. If we were to call foo on three and four, uh, we get a method error. And the reason is that we don't have a function called foo that works on integers because the way that we wrote foo is such that foo only works on strings. Uh, if we want to change that, we can. We can now write foo so that x works on integers, um, or rather x takes integers and y takes integers. And now when we call foo on x and y that are both integers, we want the printout to be x and y are both integers. So when we run this, we've now declared foo in this way. And when we call foo on three and four, um, it will print out x and y are both integers. Um, now where things start to get interesting is that when we call foo on the strings hello and hi, we get this printout saying x and y are both strings. And so this shows us that this first version of foo that we wrote up here, this version that takes strings for x and y, is still working. So when we declare this second definition, of foo, we didn't overwrite the first definition. We didn't replace that first definition. Instead, what we did was that we added a second definition um, to an existing function. In a multiple dispatch, we can do that. We can add, you know, as many different methods for a single function name as our heart desires. Um, and so, in a multiple dispatch, we have this distinction then between these generic functions and methods. Um, so we can think of the generic function as, or generic functions as sort of being tied to like the abstract concepts um, that we associate with particular operations. So for example, we have in our mind some idea of like maybe what it means to, to you know, interpolate a string or what it means to add two things together or what it means to multiply two things together. And we don't necessarily distinguish between like, oh, like how does multiplication work if you know, you're working with in 64s versus in 32s. Um, but on a computer, you do need specific methods or specific implementations um, that, are, that are written for the types of the objects that you're going to be working on or like the types of the data that you're going to be passing uh, to your function or to your method. And so, and so these specific implementations are the methods um, and the generic functions are what we as users can work with. Um, now in Julia, we do have this function called methods, which allows us to see which methods are associated with a particular function name. So we've declared this function called foo. When we call methods on foo, we see that there are two methods right now for foo, or there are two different definitions out there, two different ways to call the function foo. Similarly, if I were to call methods on the plus operator in Julia, we see that in Julia there are 163 different ways in the base language to add things together based on you know whether we're adding together dates or floating point numbers or complex numbers or, you know, reals to complex numbers or what have you. So this is basically a giant combinatorics problem. And you can see where all of these different um, definitions for these different implementations of addition uh, exist. Now, we saw in the last notebook this at which macro. 
Um, in this notebook, the, the benefit of calling at which on a given piece of code is to show which method associated with a more generic function is actually being dispatched. So when I call at which on, um, on foo, which takes three and four as its input arguments, we see that the version of foo that's being dispatched is the version of foo that takes two integer inputs, uh, which was declared at line seven in the current notebook. Similarly, if I were to call at which on 3.0 and 3.0, we see now that the version of addition that's being used is the version in base that takes two floating point numbers, two floating point 64s, as its input arguments. So, so that gives us a sense of, of what's going on under, under the, the hood a bit. And, and maybe to, to make this a bit more explicit, the reason that this allows Julia code to be you know, special, or the, the thing that, that about multiple dispatch that allows Julia to be both fast and easy to use is that you know, we as the users, again, can, can just work with generic functions if that's what we want to do. We, can just, we don't have to specify types. Um, we can just think about sort of these abstract operations like addition and multiplication. And, uh, and that allows us to work with a very like, dynamic and high level language. Um, but at the same time, the fact that the compiler is choosing a very well tailored method for us based on, you know, based on these more primitive operations that have very specific definitions like addition, for example, which is written, you know, 163 different ways means that at the end of the day, we can get really efficient machine code without needing to specify exactly what we're doing because the compiler figures it out for us because of this design paradigm. All right, so with that, uh, we do have a type hierarchy in Julia, and I'll show you how that becomes relevant here. Uh, when I say we have a type hierarchy, what I mean is that there are, of course, these sort of concrete types like um, we've talked about in 64, we've seen the use of, of strings and, and float 64, um, but you know we might want to talk about some of these concrete types in terms of abstractions. We might want to talk about numbers rather than specifically in 32 or in 16 or in 64. Um, and so we have in Julia, uh, you can think of the Julia type structure as sort of a, a tree, um, where at the very top of the tree is the any type. And so every single concrete type in Julia is going to fall under this, this big umbrella of the any type. Um, and then between the top of the tree, where we have the any, and the bottom of the tree, where we have, um, where we have the concrete types like N64 and float32, uh, we have these other abstract types, like for example, the concept of a number, um, where a number is going to incorporate, you know, any any real number or any complex number, and you know, real numbers will include all of your floating point numbers and 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 all of your you know regular int integer numbers and and, and what have you. Um, where this comes in in the case of multiple dispatch is that. Um, the, the method that gets dispatched for you when you provide a given set of inputs is always going to be the method that is the most specific um, given yeah, what exists. And so, for example, let's look at this. So if we declare foo in this way, what we're saying is now x can be any type of number, y can be any type of number, and when this version of foo gets called, I want to print that x and y are both numbers. So we declare foo in this way. Now we see that there are three methods existing for the function foo that we've created. And we haven't declared a version of foo that specifically takes floating point numbers, but this numbers version of foo is going to work perfectly well. Um, but it's worth noting that if we go back to calling foo on just three and four, the integers three and four, um, we're getting that integer version of foo being used. We can see that either by calling foo or by saying at which on foo. Um, so the idea is that even though this numbers version could work in theory for this um, this uh, set of integer input arguments. Um, this version of foo, the one that takes two n64s, is more specific to these input arguments. So that's the one that gets dispatched at runtime. All right. Um, at the end of the day, we always have the option to write more generic fallback methods that don't specify their input types. So for example, here we're saying foo on x and y takes inputs of any type, and now. If I were to pass, for example, the vector v to foo, uh, I would get this generic fallback sort of duct tape method. So that is it for our intro to multiple dispatch. And we have two notebooks left now on uh, linear algebra. I will point out, um, just in case people start dropping off, that at the very end, 
of Notebook 12. Um, we have this tiny URL link um, that will take you to a, a Julia feedback survey. And the idea of that is to, to see how we're doing with these tutorials and uh, how accessible you found or did not find the tutorial. Um, and so with that, we'll go to Notebook 11, which is our intro to linear algebra. Okay. And what we're going to see in this notebook are um, like the basics of working with matrices and vectors. First off, we can start by creating a matrix A um, with the rand function that we've seen before. So here we're saying we want the numbers that populate the random function or the random matrix to be between one and four. Um, and then here we're using that fill function that we saw earlier to create a vector um, with three elements. So in base Julia, um, matrix vector multiplication is defined. Um, so we can just say A star X if we want to create a linear system where AX equals B. And then uh, if we want to transpose a matrix, we can either do conjugate transposition or, uh, or regular transposition with no conjugation. If we want to do conjugate transposition, we can add um, an apostrophe after our matrix. So I'll show this here. Um, and you can see that the four and the one there switched spots from here. Um, if you wanted to simply transpose, you would use the transpose function as opposed to the, the uh, apostrophe. But um, in this case, you can't see the difference because we're not working with imaginary numbers. This is just a real matrix. If you want to do transpose multiplication in Julia, so for example, if you wanted to add the transpose or the conjugate transpose in this case of A uh, to, or sorry, multiply it by the matrix A itself, you could say A prime star A, um, or you could just say A prime A. Uh, so Julia knows what to do without seeing the star operator in this particular case. If you want to solve a linear system in Julia, you can use the backslash character. So say that we have a linear system AX equals B. We want to figure out what X is. Uh, we have the matrix A and the vector B. We can say A slash B. Um, and then the vector that gets returned should be uh, the, the solution vector X. We can use this backslash uh, independent of, uh, of whether the system is square um, or you know, exactly determined. So here I'm creating this matrix called A tall um, to be uh, with more rows than columns, such that we have an overdetermined linear system. And now if I were to call A tall backslash B, um, what I'm going to get is the least squares solution for the solution vector X. Um, in this next example, I'm now creating this matrix called rank def um, to indicate that it's rank deficient. Um, what I mean by that, what we're doing here is that we're creating a vector V, and then we're using this command called hcat to concatenate two vectors together to build a matrix from those vectors. And so what we end up doing here is that we have um, one matrix that has two columns where each of those columns is the same vector. So that's our rank deficient system. And if we solve now the linear system by saying rank diff um, slash B, what we're going to get in this case is whatever Julia determines is the minimum norm least squares solution. Similarly, we'll get the minimum norm least squares solution uh, when we solve an underdetermined system. So here we have this matrix called A short, uh, which has more columns than rows. And when we do A short backslash B, um, we get our minimum norm solution there. Um, another thing to note, what we're going to see in this next notebook on linear algebra is that uh, we're going to have to, in Julia 1.0, say using linear algebra to get uh, functionality for the more, um, yeah, more advanced linear algebra functionality, like working with special matrices and that sort of thing. And I'll, I'll show that in the next, um, in the next notebook. Um, yeah, the, the exercises at the end of this show you are, are meant to get you uh, doing things like creating an, an inner product and an outer product. Um, let's see, do we have a vector V? We have a vector V. If we wanted the inner product of V, um, we can take advantage of the fact that transpose multiplication doesn't need that uh, apostrophe, or not apostrophe, asterisk uh, to multiply things. So we can just say V prime V to get the inner product. And if we wanted the outer product, we could say V times V prime now. Um, and there's our outer product of the vector V with itself. Uh, so that's it for our intro to linear algebra. And now in this last notebook, notebook 12, uh, on factorizations and other fun, 
Uh, we're going to talk about how to factorize matrices in Julia. Um, and then uh, we'll talk about special matrix structures and a little bit about generic linear algebra at the end. And again, if you do, um, if you are willing to take a little bit of time at the end, uh, there's just a few questions in this, this ending survey. All right, so factorization, special matrix structures, and generic linear algebra. So again, we're going to start by creating a sort of toy linear system uh, with the matrix A, uh, the vector V, um, the, the vector, uh, the vectors X, and the vector V. And we also here are using linear algebra explicitly. Okay, so factorization in Julia. For those of you that are maybe less familiar, um, the idea of a matrix factorization is that it can make it easier to solve a linear system sometimes if we take the matrix that represents our linear system and we express it in a different way, where we express it in terms of um, two or more um, somewhat easier to work with matrices. Um, and so one type of, of factorization that we see commonly in linear algebra is the LU factorization. And this is um, an expression for an LU factorization where what we're saying is that um, the matrix P times the matrix A is going to be equal to the matrix L times the matrix U. So the idea then is that we would start with matrix A and that we would create these matrices P, L, and U, which together we could use to reconstruct A, where working with P, L, and U individually is going to be a little bit easier than, than working with A. Um, okay, so how would we actually do an LU factorization in Julia? We can do that using this LU function. So when we call LU on the matrix A, um, here I'm binding the output to this uh, object or this variable called ALU. And what that output is, um, is something of the type LU, um, which we can see is storing uh, the matrix L that comes out and the matrix U that comes out. Um, if we look at the type of ALU, we again see the signature that we got up here, which says that this is something of type LU. Um, so this is a factorization object that's storing the, factor, the, the factors or the factorized matrices that we would get out of our factorization. If we wanted to reach inside that factorization object and grab any of the individual matrices, um, we can do that by saying, for example, alu.l to grab the lower triangular matrix, um, alu.u to grab the upper triangular matrix, and does this work? Yeah, alu.p um, to grab the permutation matrix, which in this case is just the identity matrix. Um, now, Julia can dispatch methods on factorization objects. Uh, so what I mean by that is that we saw in the last notebook that you could solve a linear system ax equals b by saying a backslash b. But you could solve the exact same linear system um, by saying alu backslash b if you have stored the factorized um, object from a um, inside the object alu. So Julia here is, it, it knows how to solve a linear system using a factorized object. That's the point, that it's dispatching on the type of the thing that's being passed as this first input to backslash there. Uh, similarly, if you were to call det uh, on the matrix A, you would get the determinant of the matrix A. Um, but similarly, if you were to call det on uh, our, factor, our factorization object, you would get the same determinant output. So Julia is dispatching there on the, uh, on the object that we've passed to det. Another example of a factorization in Julia, we could do a QR factorization in much the same way that we just did an LU factorization. Now uh, the command that we're using, or the function, is QR. So we call QR on A to get a factorization object. And in this case, the output type is linear algebra dot QR compact. Um, and that is the type of this object AQR that I've bound that factorization object to. Um, again, we can reach inside this factorization object with a dot to say aqr dot q to grab the matrix q or aqr dot r uh, to, to grab the, um, the, the upper triangular matrix r. Uh, eigen decompositions are another example of a factorization we might do. So here I'm creating a symmetric matrix um, called a sim by adding a matrix a to the conjugate transpose of a. And then when we call eigen, on ASIM, we get this, uh, this eigen output, or this eigen factorization object. And now our keywords to grab and to look inside and grab our, our factorization object um, values are our values and vectors. So we can grab the eigenvalues here, the eigenvectors there. And another nice note to make here is that um, when we calculate the inverse of a factorized object, such as ASIM eig, um, particularly um, the factorization object that we would get out of 
and eigen decomposition, uh, what we're really doing to calculate the inverse um, of the matrix expressed as our factorization object here is that we're making use of the eigenvectors and the eigenvalues um, of that factorization object to calculate the inverse. So that was our section on factorization, and now we are on to special matrix structures. Um, now, when I've given this tutorial in person, I found that um, most of my audiences don't really have much of a sense at first for what a special matrix is or what a special matrix structure means. Um, and so let's talk about that first. Um, when I say special matrix structure, what I mean is that often if you're to look at a matrix and the way that data or you know, numbers are organized within that matrix, what you'll find is that um, you know, the numbers organized in that matrix are not randomly distributed. Often, um, often there is some structure to the way that data is laid out within a matrix. Um, and so we have this notion of special matrix structures or special matrix types um, to denote the way that the data in a matrix might be organized. And that's very abstract, but concretely, um, you know, you might have, for example, a matrix that is almost entirely filled with zeros, um, but instead of being entirely filled with zeros, it has non-zero entries on the diagonal of the matrix. Um, alternatively, uh, you might have an upper triangular matrix, for example, where that upper triangular matrix um, has non-zero entries for everything above the diagonal, but only zero entries for everything below the diagonal. A uh, lower triangular matrix would be sort of the opposite of that, where everything below the, the diagonal might be non-zero, but everything above the diagonal is zero. And, uh, and the reason that this structuredness matters is that you can imagine that the larger a matrix becomes, you know, the more work it is to work with all of the entries of that matrix every time you perform some sort of matrix operation. And similarly, the more space you require to, to hold uh, in memory, all of the different uh, entries of that matrix. And so if you can just kind of make a mental note or tell Julia to make a mental note uh, that, you know, basically everything is zero except for like this set of things, this small set of things on the diagonal or, you know, the half that's in the, the upper half of the matrix, for example, uh, you can save a lot on memory and also in computation because you don't have to spend as much time explicitly multiplying every zero in, you know, the zero portions of the matrix by all the other zeros. Uh, if you were doing like a matrix matrix multiplication, for example. Um, so, so Julia gives us a way to work explicitly with special matrix structures so that we can save both you know, space um, and time in, in performing a computation. And we can look in this section at the impact of, of using or taking advantage of these special matrix structures. And so we're going to do that by starting with um, creating a matrix A. Uh, which I don't display here, I've silenced that output because it's a very large matrix, it's a thousand by a thousand, so it has a million different elements. And, um, and we're going to take that matrix A and use it to build a symmetric matrix ASIM. And so ASIM uh, is similarly going to have um, a million elements, um, but, uh, but only you know, roughly half a million unique elements. Um, and so if we call the function, first off, is symmetric on the matrix A sim, uh, what we see is the output true. And so this is us asking Julia, is this matrix A sim symmetric? And Julia is saying, yes, it is a symmetric matrix because Julia can tell automatically that, you know, that the matrix is symmetric. But the thing is that as we work with matrices um, you know, in real life, we are going to be accumulating error, um, particularly floating point error, along the way. Um, so this means that, you know, 1.0 is really not 1.0 under the hood. Often it's like 0.9999999998 or something. Um, and, and as we accumulate floating point error, it can get in the way of Julia's ability to determine if a matrix is truly symmetric, for example, or if it's truly diagonal. Um, because, uh, you know, the, there's no longer enough information for the language to determine if, you know, 0 0.0001 is really meant to be a zero or if we intended to add a little bit of, of noise um, effectively to an otherwise zero entry. So um, floating point error can get in the way and we're going to demo that by looking inside. Well, first we're going to copy this matrix ASIM. And we're going to create a new matrix called ASIM noisy. And then we're going to look inside that matrix called ASIM noisy and we're going to change just one of the elements um, by adding um, five times eps to it. 
And it gives you a sense of what five apps is. When we run this, I'm going to output five apps. So we're talking about adding noise on the order of 10 to the negative 15. Um, having updated just you know one of the million elements in this matrix with this bit of noise here, um, when we call is symmetric on asim noisy, we get false as the output. So Julia can no longer take a guess that this is a symmetric matrix because Julia cannot tell if this noise is intentional or just you know a side effect of having done a bunch of matrix vector multiplications or something. So what can we do if, uh, if Julia can't automatically see that the matrix is symmetric? Well, we can tell Julia explicitly that the matrix is symmetric, and we can do that by using this symmetric function, which is going to construct um, a symmetric matrix from it. So here, when I call symmetric on asim noisy, um, I'm creating this matrix called asim explicit. And similarly, if I wanted to, I could have told Julia that I wanted to create a diagonal or a triangular or you know, a tridiagonal, a sim tridiagonal, an upper triangular, there, there are lots of different things we could do, but um, we have lots of different functions for creating matrices with special types, but here we're working with the symmetric matrix type. Um, and so now that we, we've done this, we've, we've created three different versions of the same symmetric matrix. One that Julia could just tell was symmetric right away, a sim. One that Julia can't tell is symmetric because of a bit of noise called asim noisy. And one that we've explicitly said is symmetric called asim explicit. And what we'll do here is that we're going to perform the same operation on all three versions of this matrix and we're timing how long that operation of grabbing the eigenvalues from the matrix takes. And what we see is that when Julia can tell that the matrix is symmetric, either because you know it's obvious to the compiler or because we've said explicitly this is a symmetric matrix, we get much better runtime. So in this case, like almost, it's, it's a, between a factor of four and a factor of five. Um, faster when Julian knows that the matrix is symmetric. Um, so this is the value of being able to say explicitly what the structure of our matrix is. Um, and for those of you that are interested in linear algebra functionality in Julia, I will say that um, you can also create sparse matrices in Julia with, um, you know, where a sparse matrix would be a matrix that has uh, relatively few uh, non-zero entries, but where the structure or the arrangement of, of the sparse um, the sparse entries is not as uh, predictable, perhaps, as in the case of a diagonal matrix or, um, or a symmetric matrix or what have you. Uh, so with that, another example of taking advantage of special matrix structure is here. Where here we're creating, okay, so this is the number n, and we're setting it equal to a million. Uh, this throws people off sometimes because there are these weird underscores. Those underscores are just there for readability, so if I wanted to, like, I could, for any number that I create, um, I could add sort of arbitrary underscores and it doesn't actually change the number, um, but it's, it's nice to be able to uh, sort of see where the commas would be if we were, or the periods depending on uh, where you're coming from. But uh, yes, so this is for readability. This is the number a million. We are using this number a million to create a million by million um, symmetric tridiagonal matrix. And specifically we're populating the um, the diagonals, so the, the primary diagonal in the middle and then uh, the diagonal on either side with these random vectors, rand of n and rand of n minus one. So we've got now this million by million matrix that only has three of the diagonals populated and uniquely only two of the diagonals populated. So it's mostly zeros. And what we see when we run this is that we can grab the maximum eigenvalue of this very large million by million matrix, so you know, something that has 10 to the 12 different entries, um, we can calculate the maximum eigenvalue of that matrix in just over a second in Julia. Whereas, you know, if we actually had to use a dense matrix to store this huge thing, um, if we had to explicitly work with all of the zeros, for example, um, we wouldn't even be able to do a calculation like this on, on a laptop. All right, so our final section in the tutorial is on a generic linear algebra. Um, so in this section, um, we're going to be talking about uh, support for, um, for linear algebra in Julia that goes beyond simply like wrapping blasts and, and LAPAC subroutines. Um, so that's the traditional way. The traditional way of, of adding functionality for linear algebra to a new programming language would be to take advantage of you know, these existing um, libraries and, um, and standards. Um, and, and that is what is done in Julia to, um, to work with um, linear systems comprised of 
float 32s and float 64s and for example complex numbers built on each of those types um, but Julia now also offers support for generic linear algebra which is to say that you could work with you know matrices and vectors of rational numbers for example um, and continue to work you could not only start with the system of rational numbers but continue to work with rational numbers rather than getting those rational numbers converted to decimal points or floating point numbers um, so let me show you what I mean by that um, first off, rational numbers in Julia are created with this double slash. So if I were to say 1 over 2, I would get 1 divided by 2 and I would end up with 0 0.5. But if I say 1 slash slash 2, then we get the rational number 1 over 2. And I can maybe further prove that to you by calling this type of function on 1 slash slash 2. So that is a rational number composed of integers. Now in Julia, we can create a rational system of uh, equations. Um, like so. So here what we're doing is we're creating a matrix. Um, we are specifically here saying that we want our rationals to be composed of big integers rather than irregular integers and that's um, a trick for storing sometimes large things. Um, and so then we're creating this random matrix here and I think I'm actually, because I have a little bit of extra time, I'm just going to pull this apart a little bit more um, so you can kind of see what's happening line by line. So if I were to just um, create this rand, I have this rand call here. There we're just generating a, uh, a matrix, a three by three matrix that has numbers between one and 10. Um, if I were, if I had just divided this by 10, um, then I would get a division of each of the entries by 10 here. Um, but what instead is happening is that we're creating a matrix of rationals by wrapping this um, rand 1 to 10 um, call here with this matrix rational big int sort of signature there. Um, and then we're dividing by 10 afterwards um, so that we actually have meaningful fractions rather than just having everything divided by 1. So this was how we created this matrix A rational here. So we have a rational matrix to represent a rational linear system. Here we're creating a vector x that's filled with just integer ones. And then what we're doing here is we're creating a vector b by multiplying a rational times x. And what we're seeing is that this output vector b that we get when we multiply a rational by x is a vector that contains rational numbers. Similarly, if we wanted to solve the rational system, a rational slash b, um, our output vector x now is also going to contain rational numbers, which instead of just being 1 or 1 divided by 1 in each case explicitly. And similarly, we could do things like you know, perform an LU factorization of a, uh, a rational linear system. And so that is it for our tutorial material. Um, hopefully this was helpful, and uh, hopefully you were able to answer question, or ask and get answer any questions on the live chat uh, if anything was unclear. Uh, in the same directory where you're able to see all of these intro to Julia tutorials, you will also be able to see um, some what I think are fun exercises for um, practicing or playing around with Julia a bit. Um, I think maybe the best place is to start, um, and it, it depends on what your background is, but um, if you are coming, especially from like a more of a STEM background, um, I think this calculate pi exercise can be really helpful. Um, this create a Caesar cipher uh, is maybe fun for playing around with multiple dispatch and strings. Um, we have an exercise here on exploring benchmarking and performance. And, uh, and yeah, here's an example on auto differentiation as well. Um, so those are things I won't be able to cover today. But um, if, you, if you need help with, with you know, getting up and running with the language, there are lots of resources online. And let me flip back to my slides. So again, um, if you're interested in joining uh, our communities on Slack or Discourse or GitHub, again, there are friendly people in all of those places. If you want to get in contact with me because something was unclear in this tutorial or otherwise, um, my GitHub handle is xorjane. Um, that's also my name on the Julia Slack channel, which again, you could join here by going to slackinvite.julialang.org. And otherwise, that is all for today. So thank you very much for watching. All right, bye.